they see this now, right? No, not yet. So I go to... back and change form. I think maybe that's. Yeah, okay. So now your controls are at the bottom. So. Uh, hit, click on participants so you can see who's there and then attendees. Um, and now I'm going to go log in as um, from the conference room. Okay. So then you can get. Rob, is their name John Moore, Set Dan Solper? Yeah. So I just promote them to panelists? Yep. And, um, so they need the mic, though. Mm -hmm. Only where you go. And then once you share your screen. So then it's share. Share, yep. And then, so I want, where is that? It might be that. Yes. Did you still have it pulled up? Let me see what it is. It should be, yeah, it's the screen you just had it on the other tab. Yeah, now it should show that one. So it's uh, that this. One. There yep. we go. Shit. Okay, so then, the, so I don't have to do anything with that. I control everything from here. Yep. And so if, all right, so I'm not muted right now. Or I am, no, I'm not. Oh, can you see the He'd like to uh, say. Yeah, I, I'd like to say to you guys that uh, we come down to these meetings have in the past for years, and we've always come as a foursome. And we've always, almost always had the same driver in his van. And uh, that was our good friend uh, who we lost this last year, uh, Paul Hollins, that uh, one of our rules officials. And, and if we could just do a moment of silence for Paul, I, I'd appreciate it. I'm sure he would. Thanks, guys. So, so thank, thank you, Gary. And we will cer certainly miss Paul. I had the honor of being his partner once. Uh, at one point, before we get started and before we go live, so please, uh, Jeff, hope we're not. Uh, and we'll get into uh, some more detail once we go live. But just to remind everyone that we are live to, for other people uh, listening in to us, and this will be recorded for people to hear later. So just keep that in mind with all our comment, comments and questions uh, so that uh, you know any, anything we say reflects positively on the WSGA. And we, we won't have people in Texas saying, what the heck are those guys in Wisconsin doing? Um, or at least not in a negative way. <laughs> so uh, just a reminder for that. But otherwise, uh, uh, Jeff and Rob, we can start whenever you say.
Good to go, John. Good to go. All right. All right. Well, well welcome everyone for to the 2019 Wisconsin State Golf Association rules review sessions. They're going to have six of these half day sessions geared primarily towards uh, WSGA officials, but uh, also, you know, very happy to have anyone and everyone uh, join us, whether in person uh, or remotely live or via recording. We appreciate all the uh, interest and enthusiasm. We're very lucky to have such a strong experience and enthusiastic uh, group of rules officials here uh, here in the state. And as all of you know, uh, this is uh, more meaningful than, uh, than usual than we've done in past years because the rules of golf have been significantly revised for this year, the biggest revision since uh, 1984, uh, arguably since 1952. Uh, so there's a lot uh, to learn. And before we get into the details, just want to try to put things a little bit in perspective that while learning the new rules can seem somewhat of a daunting task, that uh, things aren't really quite as daunting as th they, they first appear. That what can be a little intimidating to experienced rules officials is knowing or seeing that the terminology is different and the format of the rules is very different. And it makes people uncomfortable that we're, when people would know that, for example, old rule 26 covered water hazards and now, well, water hazards aren't called water hazards anymore and they're, the relief procedure is in a different rule and people might not yet know, be as familiar with the book to know, for example, to turn to rule 17, look at penalty areas that once we all get familiar with the uh, terminology as well as with the format of the rules, uh, the anxi anxiety level will really uh, decrease by quite a bit. And put, to put it in perspective, uh, David Stabler on the USGA staff uh, estimated that, he, that about 20% of the content of the rules is new. That in other words, 80% is not new. So, you know, when, when we go through things over the coming weeks, you realize, oh yeah, I already know this. This is exactly the same procedure as uh, before, just in a different place in the book and perhaps with uh, a few different words, but the content is really the same and, and we'll see that. So uh, as we get through it, hopefully uh, everyone's comfort level will uh, improve. And that's one reason that for the format of these uh, review sessions that we are just going to stay with our normal low tech format of just going through the uh, rules book, or as uh, someone's called it, the middle size book, the medium size book, that we have the uh, uh, player's edition, which is a new uh, publication for this year that's really geared towards what golfers really need to know in order to get around the golf course in a very friendly uh, format, friendly language. Then we have this book, which is the actual rules of golf. And then we have uh, the quote unquote big book, the official guide, which is somewhat similar to the previous decisions book. In fact, it's the exact same size. It looks like it, but it's uh, qu quite a bit different. It has the rules. It has the interpretations. Uh, and interpretation is the new word for decisions. And you'll see there are far, far fewer interpretations than there were uh, decisions, but it has, uh, among other things, a, ni a very nice uh, new section called um, committee procedures that is uh, can serve as a bit of a checklist for committees whether it's broken down into how a committee will approach things, whether it's just for daily play at its golf course or whether it's for a competition. You know, it has uh, guidance on, uh, you know, marking the golf course, on adopting local rules and various things like that. So a lot of uh, useful information uh, in that. But for the purpose of, of these sessions, we will be using just the rules of golf itself, the medium size book. And, you know, partly because one of the you know great benefits of this of the 2019 rules as is that close to 500 previous decisions their messages have been moved from the decisions book into the rules themselves so there is much less emphasis and much less need for the uh, uh, interpretations it's so, it's so much more information is contained in just the rules themselves and also by going through 
the rules book itself, you know, that will help us all become more familiar with the format of the book, the layout, and um, uh, by using it. Um, so with that, and another thing with the, you, you'll have probably notice that the definition section now appears at the back of the rules book. So what we will be doing is at the start of each rule, we will go over a few of the definitions that are they're particularly important to that rule before we dive in, into the rule itself. And, and with these uh, sessions, you know, we're very fortunate uh, that uh, it, uh, uh, Dan Stolper here, our uh, WSJ's uh, Rules Vice Chairman, will be uh, uh, reviewing these uh, along with me. That I think it's uh, other than the USGA staff, I'm not sure anyone in this country has spent more time on the 2018 rules than Dan has. So, you know, we're very lucky to uh, have Dan uh, uh, with us. In fact, uh, next week when I'm on my honeymoon, you'll have Dan uh, all day. So. <laughs> No, the so first first one was a wedding trip, okay. and it was, it was short enough that my wife and I decided it didn't count as a honeymoon. Oh, so. Who makes that rule? Uh, well, she and I did. <laughs> and then uh, uh, a quick word from our sponsor before we get going, that if you turn to page, I guess it would be 14 in the rules book, you'll see a very nice picture of a certain golf course here in Wisconsin that hosted uh, the 2017 U.S. Open. <laughs> So that's a, a, a nice touch. So with, with that, we will let's uh, go ahead and uh, get started with rule one. And with rule one, we just had one definition to go over at the start, and it's not exactly the most complicated one, and that is uh, general penalty. Uh, definition found page 205, which is the same as it's been, been before, is uh, the general penalties, loss of hole, match play, or two strokes and stroke play. But we will use this phrase uh, much more in the 2019 rules, because the rules themselves use it more, where instead of having a penalty statement where it'll say loss of hole or and match play or two strokes and stroke play, it'll be more simplifying to say uh, penalty is the general penalty. And that, that is what that means. So now with rule one itself, and first we'll, we'll no, notice right away a, a change in the format. And I think a very, uh, a, a very good, good and useful change is that each rule now opens with a purpose statement. So that help, gives us insight as to the philosophy, into one, the philosophy of what that rule is trying to accomplish, and then two, how that rule intends to accomplish that. And, and there are many more philosophical uh, statements and principles expressed in these rules than before. And that's very helpful with the rules because it helps us understand what each rule is, uh, that helps us understand a rule better when we know what that rule is tr trying to accomplish you know, with that. So for example, with rule one here, the purpose statement starts out with it and introduces uh, these key principles, which we've heard people generalized before, but they weren't explicitly stated in the uh, rules themselves. That is, play the course as you find it and play the ball as it lies. And when you think about it, so many of the rules revolve around uh, just those two principles. Also talk about playing by the rules and in the spirit of the game, something that again was not explicitly stated and also uh, expressed the statement that uh, the player is responsible for applying uh, uh, his own penalties. All right, so with that, uh, rule 1.1, notice that uh, a change in format. Uh, previously we used 1-1, one uh, but now it's 1.1 uh, for, for the, the numbering. Uh, uh, no uh, uh, changes in content here, still, uh, Golf is played in a round of 18 or fewer holes by striking a ball uh, with the club. Each hole starts uh, with a stroke from the teen area and ends when the ball is holed. And then here we have those principles mentioned in the purpose statement. For each stroke, the player must play the course as he or she finds it and must play the ball as it lies. But as we'll see, there are some exceptions that allow the player either to alter the conditions or uh, to have the player play from somewhere else, such as, say, if the ball's on a cart path. All right, rule 1.2, uh, uh, standards of player conduct. 
Now, one thing you'll notice is that with the new rules, there's no longer what? An etiquette section as there was in the previous book. And then much of the information that was in the old etiquette section is now embedded in the rules themselves. You know, in part, just to strengthen that itself, to say, to, so to be able to tell players, hey, look, it's in the rules themselves that you need to, that you're expected to take good care of the course and things like that. So it puts it more uh, front and center. Uh, 1.2a, conduct expected of all players. And expected is a strong word, and that lets players know uh, what, uh, you know, what is expected of them. And one thing to keep in mind with the rules is that, you know, the rules are for everyone, for whether it's uh, people who have been officiating for years and years, for players, but also newcomers to the game. So imagine if you are a new golfer, you, and saying, I'm going to take up golf in 2018. Let's see what the rules are. And right away, it tells you, geez, this is what's expected of me. That sends a pretty strong message from the start, which, which, is, uh, which is a very positive thing. All players are expected to play in the spirit of the game by acting with integrity. For example, by following the rules, applying penalties, and being honest, by showing consideration to other players for example, not distracting others, by taking good care of the course, replacing divots, raking bunkers, and so forth. So, but there is no penalty under the rules for failing to act in this way, except the committee has the authority to disqualify your player for acting contrary to the spirit of the game if it finds that the player has committed serious misconduct. So not a new principle, and we, there is, an interpretation uh, 1.2a slash 1 that goes over examples of acts that are, that would and would not uh, constitute serious uh, misconduct. And one of the key points, one of the key messages is that in many cases, before a player reaches the point of disqualification, it makes sense to warn the player to say, Look, this is not acceptable. If you continue to do this, you'll be disqualified. Um, but certainly there can be one-off situations where a single act would warrant uh, disqualification. So, uh, so if a player acts bad enough, he can be uh, disqualified. But then we go on to say penalties other than disqualification may be imposed for player misconduct only if those penalties are adopted as part of a code of conduct. So if the committee has not adopted a code of conduct, then it's all or nothing in terms of penalty, either no penalty or disqualification. But this ability of a, for a committee to adopt a code of conduct is new for 2019 and is up to each committee to decide if it's going to adopt a code of conduct. And if so, what, the, what it will address, will it address uh, dress code, will address language, uh, other behavioral uh, uh, points, and then that code of conduct itself could apply other penalties, such as a one-stroke penalty for doing this or a two-stroke penalty for uh, potentially building up to the uh, penalty of uh, disqualification. And that's what this next section, 1.2b, uh, talks about. And then you see in blue the reference to committee procedures, which is that section in the big book, the official guide. Uh, that uh, goes into that in, uh, in some detail. So, but for the purposes of this, you know, all we need to know is the committee now has the authority to establish a code of conduct and to uh, uh, apply penalties under it. All right, one point, rule 1.3, plain by the rules. First, we start out by what does the term rules means? Well, it's the 24 rules and definitions and any local rules. And players are also responsible for uh, complying with the terms of the competition. Now notice with this, what is not included in the meaning of rules? Interpretations. And, and that's very interesting. And I think we should all take comfort from that because what that means is that the interpretations really are just that. They are interpretations and there aren't actually, it's not a backhanded way or sneaky way to write rules. That, that as you go, as you spend time uh, in the official guide and going through the interpretations, you realize that mo the great, great majority of interpretations really just provide examples uh, uh, of certain rules. 
So uh, that's just an interesting uh, uh, point to note. John, question? Yeah, yeah, Dan. What happens if the interpretation appears to contradict the rule directly? Do we follow the rule? What appear? What happens if the if an interpretation appears to contradict the rule? Well, I, I think if it covers a specific situation, then I think we're obligated to apply the interpretation. All right, one point three B, applying the rules. Uh, the player is responsible for applying the rules. Players are expected, there's that word again, are expected, expected to recognize when they've breached a rule and to be honest in applying their own penalties. So in other words, uh, you know, ignorance of the rules is not uh, uh, an excuse. You go on to say if a player knows that he or she has breached a rule that involves a penalty and deliberately fails to apply the penalty, the player is disqualified. And note that is in both match play and stroke play with no uh, qualification. And another point uh, just to be aware of is we'll, off, we'll see the word deliberately often in the rules and that is what previously we would have, uh, where previously the word intentionally was used, now the word deliberately is used. So just something to be mindful of. <clears throat> then the uh, second part, if two or more players deliberately agree to ignore any rule or a penalty they know applies, and any of those players have started the round, they are disqualified, even if they've not yet acted on the agreement. So this is uh, just as uh, before, that if two players, the key points here is that this provision applies if the players know that they're not allowed to do what they're agreeing to do. That if, uh, let's say, if uh, Arnold and I are, are or playing and we agree um, in stroke play uh, uh, that we don't have to putt out inside a putter length of the hole. And Arnold says, you know, I know we're not allowed to do that, but let's go ahead and do that anyway to help with pace of play and it'll probably help with our score also. And then uh, once uh, one of us tees off during the round, we are disqualified. Even if, say, we have this discussion on the first screen and then we're playing with Dan, and Dan says, hey guys, you can't do that. You know, that's, uh, it, it's too late, that even though we have not yet acted on that agreement, uh, we would be uh, disqualified uh, in that case. And this is, and the key here is that we knew that what we were agreeing to do was not allowed by the rules. Those will see that that's different than if Arnold and I agree to do something out of ignorance of the rules, where let's say Arnold's ball's on a cart path and we're not quite sure of the relief procedure, but we agree that it makes sense for him to be able to drop on the right side, which turns out to be in a wrong place, and he drops and plays. You know, Arnold has played from a wrong place, and you know, in stroke play would be subject to penalty for playing from a wrong place, but he and I uh, did not deliberately agree to ignore the rules because we thought what we were doing was, was correct at the time. All right. Uh, next point, when it's necessary to decide questions of fact, such as uh, where did a ball uh, last uh, cross the edge of a penalty area? A uh, player is responsible for considering not only his own knowledge of the facts, but also all other information that's reasonably available. So in other words, if I hit my ball towards a red penalty area, you know, what we formerly thought of as a lateral water hazard, and I say, oh, and I say in my own mind, I know for sure the ball uh, crossed right here, but then there are you know, several, several other people where they're perhaps at the spot, maybe spectators or four caddy up there. And if mm -hmm. I just dis either disregard their um, uh, information or choose not to ask when in fact their information would have been very useful, then I'm on the hook if I proceed uh, uh, incorrectly. A uh, player may ask for help uh, with the rules from a referee or the committee, but if help's not available, the player must play on and raise the question uh, later. And we'll see under Rule 20 what a player can do in match play and what a player can do in stroke play if he or she's not sure uh, what, what to do. All right, uh, Rule 1.32, uh, accepting the player's reasonable judgment in determining the location when applying the rules. This is a new and uh, important uh, section in the rules. You know, it hints at uh, several parts that previously have been embedded in decisions, 
but now it formally uh, puts them in the rules. Many rules require a player to determine a spot, point, line, area, or other location, such as where the ball last crossed the edge of a penalty area, um, estimate or measuring when dropping a ball when taking relief, or replacing a ball on its original spot. Now, does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, the Lexi Thompson situation, right, out in uh, Palm Springs. Now, such determinations uh, need to be made promptly and with care, but due to their very nature, can't be precise. That There's really no way to know exactly where a ball that's 30 feet off the ground, you know, cross the edge of the penalty area. All you can do is, is uh, do gather uh, what information you reasonably can and do your, make your uh, best judgment based on that information. So, so long as the players, player does what can be reasonably expected under the circumstances uh, to make an accurate determination, the player's reasonable judgment will be accepted even if after the stroke the determination is shown to be wrong by video or other information. However, if the player becomes aware of, wrong of a wrong determination before the stroke is made, it must be corrected. So for example, the player <clears throat> uses what would be considered reasonable judgment to estimate where his ball crossed the edge of a penalty area, and drops the ball based on that reasonable judgment. Before he plays, though, you know, he becomes aware that his reasonable judgment was wrong. Then what this says is there's no penalty, and since he hasn't played yet, he must, uh, he would correct that mistake by using what would in fact be the correct point of where the ball last crossed the um, edge of the penalty area. So a, a, use, a useful and important point is now uh, part of the rules. All right, 1.3c uh, penalties. Uh, a penalty applies when a breach of a rule results from the player's own actions or the actions of his or her caddy. So nothing uh, new there. And then we have a, a couple of interesting uh, uh, additions to that. A penalty also applies when another person takes an action that would breach the rules if taken by the player or caddy and that person does so at the player's request or while acting with the player's authority. So let's say the player and his caddy are standing behind a tree uh, surveying a shot towards the green and the player asks a spectator or a marshal, hey, would you please hold that tree branch back that's 10 yards in front of me? Well, certainly if the player or caddy himself were to do that, it would be a breach of the rules. So it makes sense that if this person were to do so at the player's request for the player likewise to be penal, penal, uh, uh, penalized. Now, the second variation of that is if the player sees another person about to take an action concerning the player's ball or equipment, that he or she knows uh, would breach the rules if taken by the player or caddy and does not take reasonable steps to object or stop it from happening. So let's say um, if the uh, player you know, sees a spectator about to bend a branch back that's over his ball, you know, the player just can't say, oh, well, gee, this is my lucky day. Um, I'm not penalized because I didn't ask this person to do it. But if the player is in a position to stop that, then the player needs to stop it. The player can't take advantage uh, of that. So that, and that was a point that previously was in a uh, decision. Uh, levels of penalties, you know, which it, and it's nice that now the three different types of penalties are uh, spelled out here, you know, with a little bit of the of insight as to uh, uh, when each applies. Uh, one stroke penalty. This penalty applies in both match play and stroke play under certain rules where either A, the potential advantage from a breach is minor, or B, a player takes penalty relief by playing a ball from a different place. For example, a player uh, treats his ball as being unplayable uh, in a bush and takes unplayable relief. Uh, gen the general penalty, which we saw as loss of whole match play or two strokes in stroke play, applies for a breach of most rules where the potential advantage is more significant than where only one penalty stroke would apply. And then disqualification, which uh, can apply in both match play and stroke play for breaching 
uh, certain rules involving serious misconduct or where the potential advantage is too significant for the player's score to be considered valid. So, you know, as is, you know, the case with many things, including the legal world, there are several reasons for uh, imposing penalties. One is to deter people from breaching a rule or breaching a law. And the second is to penalize people who do to put to try to equalize things between them and those who didn't breach the rules. And with disqualification, there can be certain breaches where you simply can't quantify how much of an advantage a player may have gained. And that for, for example, if a player uses a non-conforming golf ball, it goes 50 yards farther off the tee. How do you quantify what kind of advantage uh, uh, he is gaining by using that? You really can't. So that's why the penalty for use of that ball would have to be uh, disqualification. All right, no discretion to vary penalties. Penalties need to be applied as provided in the rules. Neither a player nor the committee has authority to apply penalties in a different way. So the committee can't say, well, the rules say this is a loss of hope penalty, but that seems a little harsh in the circumstances that we're just gonna make it a one stroke penalty. Can't do that. And also an, uh, a wrong application of a penalty or failure to apply a penalty uh, may stand only if it is too late uh, to correct it. So then we'll see under rule 20 that we go uh, into some detail as to how a committee can go about correcting wrong rulings. Because as we all know, wrong rulings are a fact of life and it's uh, very good to see the rules providing guidance on how to deal with wrong rulings because that's something that every one of us on this room has had to uh, deal with before. And then interesting final uh, sentence that we touched on uh, on the previous page. Mm -hmm. In match play, the player and opponent may agree how to decide a rules issue so long as they do not deliberately agree to apply the rules in the wrong way. So keys here is that it's match play and that the players are not deliberately ignoring a rule. They simply don't know what to do. They say, well, this seems, this seems reasonable. And I turn to Phil and say, Phil, how about if if uh, I'm not quite sure where I'm supposed to drop in this case, how about if I drop over here to the left? And he says, you know, I don't know either, but that, that seems fair. So go, go ahead. Then in that case, if it's match play, uh, then uh, there, there's going to be no penalty. Now, what if in that case, I drop it over and play on the left and then Phil has second thoughts. He says, you know, John, I'm not sure you're allowed to do that. Can Phil then, uh, raise that issue. Say, John, I think you played from the wrong place and get a penalty. Answer <clears throat> is, you know, by necessity, no, uh, because that once Phil agrees uh, to a certain procedure and I do it, then uh, he, he, he has to, to live with it. How about before you play your shot? If I disagree, then you can. Yeah, I, I, th I think if before you, let's say if before I, let's say I drop and drop in a wrong place. Yeah. And then you say, and then you pull out your local rule sheet and you say, oh, John, no, actually this is covered. That, that's wrong. Then, yeah, yes, then I, I could correct the mistake in that case. Mm -hmm. All right, now uh, next section, uh, which uh, you all remember was previously, it was a very long, complicated decision. And now it's a um, long, somewhat complicated section of the rules. <laughs> but uh, the important thing is that the rules themselves now cover this situation that comes up more often than we, we might think and uh, provide and breaks it down into the uh, key criteria. If a player breaches multiple rules or breaches the same rule multiple times before an intervening event happens, and by intervening event, it could be a player making a stroke or becoming aware of the breach. The penalty that applies depends on what the player did. So first section, when the breaches resulted from unrelated acts, then the player will get a separate penalty for each breach. So let's say, uh, uh, so uh, the player does two things before he plays that have nothing to do with each other. Let's say, you know, I'm uh, in tall grass and I push the grass down around my ball. And then I ask Phil whether he thinks I 
should hit a wedge, just hack a wedge back to the fairway, or if he thinks I can get a seven iron out of that lie. I ask, I ask him for advice. So I breached two different rules. Um, and in that case, were the two breaches related in any way to each other? They, they really were not. So in that case, I'd wind up with a total of four, in stroke play, four penalty strokes. In match play, it's usually not that big of a deal because either one of those breaches involves a loss of hole penalty, so it'd be loss of hole. But in stroke play, I'd wind up with four penalty strokes because of the um, unrelated acts. You know, a, a similar situation, and going back to what uh, the first part talks about with an intervening of event, let's say, uh, you know, my ball is under a tree, and I uh, break a tree branch uh, in, to uh, improve, let's say, the area of intended swing. And then I play, but I still whiff the ball. So then I decided to break off more of that tree branch. So in stroke play, what would be the situation then? In that case, I'd have four penalty strokes is the key. Even though what I did were similar physical acts, I had an intervening act, the stroke made. And when one way to think of it is when the intervening event occurs, the penalty clock reset, resets and you start again. So in that case, it'd be four penalty strokes. All right, now what to do when breaches result from a single act or from related acts? Well, the player gets one penalty, but if the act or acts breached multiple rules involving different penalties, the higher level penalty applies. And we'll go through some examples, but what that latter part means about different penalties and again, the higher level, level penalty is let's say a player does uh, two things wrong. <clears throat> let's say he uh, moves his ball, and, and let's say in a situation where there is a penalty for it, and normally there'd be a one-stroke penalty, and what's he required to do? Replace the ball. But instead, he doesn't replace the ball, he plays the ball from its new location. So you could say, well, normally, well, what to do? One-stroke penalty or two-stroke penalty? You know, this says he gets a, a single penalty. Well, he gets the higher penalty. He gets the two-stroke penalty. So if you have a situation where you have a one player through uh, related acts has a one stroke penalty and two stroke penalty. The, this just means that he's going to get the two stroke penalty. So let's go through these three sections. Multiple procedural breaches. If a player's single act or related acts breach more than one of the procedural requirements for marking, lifting, cleaning, dropping, placing, or replacing a ball where the penalty is one stroke, such as both lifting the ball without marking its spot and clean lifted ball when not allowed, the player gets one penalty stroke in total. Now, one point notice that we'll see as we go through these rules, a very nice addition is these, the rules actually now include examples that previously the rules just were the rules, but now they have examples just to help us uh, understand the point. And, th and that's a, a great example here is to read that section without that example it's all intimidating where it will leave us, might, could leave us scratching our heads saying, well, what exactly does that mean? But that example makes it uh, very clear. Uh, second category, uh, playing an incorrectly substituted ball from a wrong place. In stroke play, if a player plays a substituted ball when not allowed and also plays that ball from a wrong place, it's going to get a total penalty of two strokes. So just as, as before. So he's done two things, but it's the same, each breach has the same penalty. Just in the first section, multiple procedural breaches, each breach carry the same penalty of one stroke. Now in the third section, we're gonna have different penalties. If a player single act or related acts breach one or more procedural requirements where the penalty is one stroke and also breach one or both of the rules against playing an incorrectly substituted ball and playing from a wrong place, player gets two penalty strokes in total. So he's done one thing that warrants a one stroke penalty, but then in a related act, something else that involves a two stroke penalty, he's going to get what the rules call the higher level level penalty, the two penalty strokes. And then one useful point that uh, a nice addition to the rules, just to uh, state it explicitly, is that any penalty strokes the player gets for taking relief, such as from a penalty area, 
always apply in addition to any other penalties. So for example, if a player is taking relief from a penalty area, drops and plays from a wrong place in stroke play, that his total penalty will be what? It'll be three strokes. One penalty stroke for taking relief and then two more for uh, playing from a wrong place. So, so that's uh, rule one, uh, basic uh, information regarding uh, relating to the game. Any uh, questions on that? Yes. The, the little arrows, there's three of them below the second bullet. Now those arrows apply just to the second bullet, is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, 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 that's a good point. That, and I'm not quite sure what the term is for those arrows. Does anyone, <laughs> I mean, we, we know bullet points, but I'm not quite sure uh, maybe we just call them arrows. Um, so then, that, but but I, I'm, I'm sorry, just so er the other people who didn't hear, hear, hear a good question and ask, those three arrows apply just to the second bullet point. So there's a follow-up question to that. You gave good examples for the first bullet point, uh, good examples. Oh. Now, are, would there be examples like that in, in the big book that I don't this yeah, yeah. In, in in the uh, in the big book, the official guide, there there will be examples of many of these points. But the point I, I was making is it doesn't apply everywhere. But in many cases, uh, uh, there are in the rules themselves some examples given where in the previous rules that that was not not the case. So with the first book point, there there just was not an example given. But but I I think think there is, there is, there are some examples and in interpretations of that. Six of them. Oh. Okay. John, I have a question. Yeah, Dan. Do you have some uh, rule of thumb on how do we remember what is a related act as opposed to an unrelated act? Uh, how to remember what's a related act or an unrelated act? I mean, I think what you know. I think one of the key points or one of the big uh, points in terms of what's related, unrelated is when there's an, been an intervening act, then there's an interpretation that says that that breaks that relationship. So anytime there's an intervening act, then the acts are going to be unrelated. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, in terms of a rule of thumb, I think the best we can do is go through the examples given and in interpretations to get a feel for, feel for that. But in terms of what a precise definition, I'm afraid I don't have one. Answer, no. No. There's no, yes. <laughs> no. But a swing is always an intervening. Yeah. yeah. No. The stroke is always an yeah. intervening. Yes. All right. With rule two, we'll start. The rule two covers the course, and we'll look at a number of uh, definitions uh, before we get into the rule itself, uh, uh, some of which are new. First definition we'll look at is areas of the course. Uh, the, which talks, which succinctly uh, lists the five different areas of the course. And that is the general area, which we previously thought of as through the green, uh, the teen area of the hole uh, being played, uh, penalty areas, what we previously thought of as water hazards, bunkers, and then the putting green of the hole uh, uh, being played. Second definition is uh, course. The entire area of play within the edge of any boundary set by the committee, all areas inside the boundary edge are in bounds and part of the course, all areas outside the boundary edge are out of bounds and therefore not part of the course. The boundary ed edge extends both up and down. And a reminder, what we just saw, the course made up of five defined areas. A uh, general area. Uh, again, what we uh, previously considered through the green, the area of the course that covers all of the course except for the four defined areas, meaning the team ground, penalty areas, bunkers, and putting green of the hole being played. The general area includes all team locations other on the course other than the specific team area uh, that you're uh, playing from. And that, you know, why, why is that important? Well. Sometimes we hit wild tee shots that come to rest on other tees. And that ju this just reminds us that we're all in, that the ball lies in the general area. And a uh, couple of new terms, uh, boundary object. Uh, artificial object defining or showing out of bounds, such as walls, fences, stakes, and railings. 
Uh, and, and very nicely, it explicitly states from which free relief is not allowed. Uh, this includes any base and post of a boundary fence, does not, does not include angled supports or a steps, bridge, or similar constructions for getting over the wall or fence. And uh, boundary objects are treated as immovable, even if they are movable or any part of them is movable. So for example, let's say there's a stone wall that the committee has said that uh, the in inside face of it defines uh, out of bounds, that by saying that it, as a boundary object, it's immovable, the player cannot go up and start dismantling that stone wall, if, for example, if it's on its line of play. And then uh, last definition for this section is integral object. Uh, on page 208, and which an integral object, which new definition is an artificial object defined by the committee as part of the challenge of playing the course from which free relief is not allowed. So, you know, most common example of that, or the best known example, is the road by the 17th green at the old course at St. Andrews, just with the thinking being that that's part of the challenge uh, of the whole and is a factor in player determining how aggressive to be with uh, the approach shot. Integral objects are treated as, in, as being immovable, but if part of an integral object, uh, such as a gate or door, meets the definition of a movable obstruction, that part is treated as a movable obstruction. So let's say there's a fence, it's not a boundary fence, and the committee has said the whole fence is an integral object, but the gate is unlocked, that the uh, player could treat that gate as movable obstruction, which means among other things, the player could move that. All right, now uh, for the rule itself. Uh, purpose of the rule introduces the basic things every player should know about the course, the five defined areas, and several types of defined objects that can interfere with play. Now, why is it important to know this? Well, because, uh, you know, knowing on what part of the course the ball lies and the status of an inter interfering object can affect the player's options for playing the ball or taking relief. So that's why it's important uh, to know all this. Uh, rule 2.1, course boundaries and out of bounds. Golf is played on a course whose boundaries are set by the committee. Areas not on the course are out of bounds. So the main takeaway from this is nothing is automatically out of bounds. It's only out of bounds if the committee says it's out of bounds. So uh, the committee does have a role to play there. Uh, 2.2 uh, uh, talks about the five areas of the course, which we largely covered in the definitions, the general area. And it, it even goes on to explain why it's called the general area, because it covers most of, most of the course and it's where a player's ball will most often be played from. Now, 2.2b, the four specific areas, teen area, penalty areas, bunkers, through the green. And look above this. This is uh, you know, one, one of the really nice additions to the rules, is the rules themselves now have diagrams. That uh, previously the decisions book had a few diagrams, but now the rules have these diagrams, and they're very nice color diagrams and simple simple to understand. So this uh, talks about that. We can see where the team ground is, where the uh, what bunkers are, what penalty areas are, uh, two different types. One, a pond up near the green, the other uh, off to the left, and the uh, uh, putting green. So we'll see, especially under the relief rules, more diagrams that uh, go a long way towards uh, helping uh, understanding. Now, determining the area of the course where the ball lies, uh, a nice addition uh, to the rules. The area of the course where a player's ball lies affects the rules that apply uh, both to playing that ball and in taking relief. So it's important to know on which part of the course the ball lies. Now, a ball is always treated as lying in, in only one area of the course. And uh, nicely, they took some information that wasn't a decision and now have put it uh, in the rules themselves. 
Now, if part of the ball is both in the general area and one of the four specific areas, then it's treated as lying in that specific area of the course. So for example, if the ball is half on the um, penalty area line and half in the general area, where is that ball considered to be? In, in the penalty area. And then the second bullet point, if part of the ball is in two specific areas of the course, it is treated as lying in the specific area that comes first in this order, penalty area, bunker, and putting green. Um, so one way to look at it is the player is going to get the uh, more severe situation. So sometimes we see, for example, the so-called uh, beach bunkers, where a bunker just goes right into a pond. And you'll see a, 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 a penalty area line painted through the sand that if part of the ball is in the bunker and part of it's on the penalty area line, then where does that ball lie? In this case, that second bullet point will say the ball's in the penalty area. All right, uh, rule 2.3. Objects or conditions that can interfere with play. Certain rules may give free relief from interference by certain objects or conditions, such as loose impediments, movable obstructions, and abnormal course conditions. And we'll go, we won't go over those definitions here because we'll cover those in those specific rules themselves where, uh, uh, with better context. Uh, and, but a reminder that there's no free relief from boundary objects or integral objects that interfere with play. All right, rule 2.4, a new term, but not necessarily a new uh, concept, uh, no play zones. A no play zone is defined as, as a defined part of an abnormal course condition. Uh, so previously, what we would call ground under repair uh, from which play is prohibited. So it could be a, a decorative flower bed, it could be environmentally sensitive area, and, or a penalty area, such as environmentally sensitive uh, wetland, where play is not allowed. Uh, a player must take relief if his or her ball is in the no play zone, or if the ball is outside the no play zone, but the no play zone interferes with the area of intended stance or swing. And a uh, nice reference to uh, section 5H of the committee procedures, reminding that a uh, code of conduct may tell players to stay out of a no play zone uh, entirely. If, for example, the committee is concerned for, for safety purposes, that let's say there is a fragile cliff in players and for legal and safety reasons, the committee simply doesn't want players going anywhere near this area, they could uh, uh, prohibit that them from simply entering it uh, as well. So that's rule two, uh, uh, talking about area, uh, various parts of the course, and a lot of this we'll go into in detail when we review those, when we take a look at those relief procedures. Uh, any questions on that? All right. If not, we'll go ahead and jump into rule three, which is a more involved rule. And we'll look at a handful of definitions to start with. First, let's look at marker. The marker uh, first applies only in stroke play. There's no marker in match play. Is the person responsible for entering the player's score on the player's scorecard and for certifying that scorecard. We'll see later uh, in this rule why we use the word certifying now instead of signing. The marker may be another player, but may not be a partner for obvious conflict of interest reasons. Um, the committee may identify who will be the player's marker or tell the players how uh, to choose a marker. Uh, match play, a form of play where a player or side plays directly against an opponent or opposing side in a head-to-head -head match of one or more rounds. You know, for example, you could have a 36-hole match consisting of two rounds. Uh, a player side wins a hole by completing the hole in fewer strokes, and the match is won when a player leads uh, the other side by more holes than remain to be played. 
And there can be several forms of match play. You can have singles match play, a three ball match, foursomes match, or a four ball match. And we'll get it, get into this uh, uh, in our last session a little bit more. Uh, now let's look at definition of opponent, player, person a player competes against in a match. Uh, this applies only in match play. Scorecard, a new definition for, for this year. Uh, and note, and what also, what's another change about this? Scorecard's now one word. So very, uh, very big change. So thank the UN. Yes. So, so now the golf world will spell scorecard the same way the rest of the world intuitively would. Um, and, you know, in fact, I think the golf world was already ready spelling as one word, just the rules of golf were spelling as two words. Uh, document where a player's score for each hole is entered in stroke play. And it could be in paper or I haven't seen this yet, or an electronic form approved by the committee that allows the score to be entered for each hole, handicap to be entered, and to allow somehow for the marker and the player to certify the scores. So if it's an elect in an electronic format, it might not necessarily involve signing, it might involve checking a box or something like that. Now a scorecard is not required in match play and may be used by the players to help keep the match score. So with that, does if for convenience two players playing a match and let's say one of them keeps a scorecard, does that scorecard carry any official significance? No, it, it does not. It's just a, a convenience for them without any official uh, meaning. And then uh, last definition for this section is stroke play. A form of play where a player or side competes against all other players or sides in the competition. So match play was head to head and stroke play you're playing against people that uh, might not even be on the golf courses at that same time. Uh, the score for rounds total number of strokes, including any penalty strokes taken to hold out on each hole and the winner is the, the player who completes all rounds in the fewest total strokes. Other forms of uh, stroke play with different scoring methods are stable for then a new format for this year called maximum score in par and bogey. And in stroke play, there can be different formats such as individual competitions or foursomes and four ball. And one thing to note with the rules is that rules uh, one through 19 or perhaps one through 20 are really written with just individual play in mind that you know there are certain things that we can extrapolate from them about what to do if this happens in four ball play or in foursome play but but for ease of use they're really written with just individual play in mind as if each of these rules was cluttered up with or partner or partner's caddy that tends to make things just more, more cumbersome and it can take away from the clarity as well all right, uh, rule three, competition. Uh, the purpose, the three central elements of all golf, golf competitions, whether it's match play or stroke play, whether it's an individual format or partnership format, and then uh, whether it's a gross competition or net competition. Those are three basic issues for each competition uh, to settle before it, it can uh, begin. All right, 3.1a, form of play, match play, or stroke play. Well, first, we acknowledge that these are very different forms of play. In match play, player and opponent compete against each other based on holes won, lost, or tied. In stroke play, all players compete with one another based on total score. That is, adding up each player's total number of strokes um, on each hole in all rounds. Most of the rules apply in both forms of play, but certain rules apply only in one or the other. And we'll see this uh, uh, later in rules uh, 21 through 23 with variations of that. All right, how players compete, playing as an individual or as partners. Golf's played by individual players competing on their own or by partners competing together as a side. While rules one through 20 focus on individual play, 
They also apply in competitions involving partners and, and team competitions. How uh, 3.1c, how players score. In a scratch competition, the player's gross score for a hole is his or her total number of strokes and without reference to any handicap stroke, any uh, handicap. Whereas in handi a handicap competition, the gross score is adjusted for the player's handicap strokes. And then, you know, we actually state in here very nicely, again, look at this from the eyes of someone new to the game, saying, well, I mean, why do you have both forms of competition? Well, it says so right here. This is done so players of differing abilities can compete in a fair way, which, you know, as we know, is one of the great benefits of golf, how you can have players of very different abilities uh, able to play, play a match against each other. All right, now 3.2, uh, dealing with match play. Uh, purpose of the rule with uh, match play as specific rules. Question. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, okay. Back to 3.1. Mm -hmm. In the old rules, okay. in the olden days, it used to say, in the rules, I think, that the stroke play and match play could not be played in the same event. Oh, you, Ken, you're, you're exactly right. That previously, it was not allowed for match play and stroke play to be played concurrently. So for you and I, for you and me to go out, play match against each other while we're also playing in a qualifier for the club uh, 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 championship, that we couldn't do that. But now that that is possible. In fact, if you see on the, on the previous page, uh, there's a reference to Section 6C in the committee procedures for about for considerations for the committee if it runs a competition that combines the two forms of play saying that you know look this is not ideal but if you do it here's here's how you should do it in, in effect and, it, and it, so it it acknowledges that it can happen and uh, you know some of the pitfalls but also give, give some guidance so so as you point out Ken that that is a change <laughs> All right, uh, 3.2 uh, with match play. Again, you know, it, it establishes some key parts that, you know, we've often taken for granted for match play, but explicitly states them that, you know, it, it emphasizes the head-to-head -head nature of match play. The players compete solely against each other on every hole. They can see each other's play and, and therefore can protect their own interests. So that's why, for example, that you can't have players, they're not playing together, have a match against each other. That, you know, because, you know, if Phil and I are playing a match, you know, how Phil plays his tee shot, that might well affect how I play my tee shot. And then I want to be able to keep an eye on him. He wants to be able to keep an eye on me. So it, it emphasizes the head-to-head -head nature. And then it also, you know, it provides some background as to why certain things in match play are the way they are. Because only Phil and I are involved in that case. Where let's say everyone at this in this room, we're having a stroke play tournament. That uh, you know we could not. Every one's not playing together, so we couldn't, for example, agree on whether you know Dan's 18-inch putt should be conceded. So that's why in stroke play, Dan has to hold out. But if just Dan and I were playing a match, I could concede that because it's just only Dan and I are involved. So some of the key uh, differences there, which in turn explains why some of the rules, especially in match play, are the way they are. All right, uh, 3.2a, uh, winning a hole. Player wins a hole when he completes the hole in fewer strokes than the opponent. The opponent concedes the hole, or the opponent uh, gets, the, uh, gets a loss of hole uh, penalty. Now, an interesting addition after this, and we'll read through it, and then we might scratch our heads, but then we'll look at an example. Um, if the opponent's ball in motion needs to be hole to tie the hole and the ball is deliberately deflected or stopped by any person at a time when there is no reasonable chance it can be hold such as when the ball is rolled past the hole and will not roll back the result of the hole has been decided and the player wins the hole does anyone remember what happened so i guess it was 2017 at the president's cup um, it, you know, with Jordan Spieth, is it in either, I, I, maybe it was a foursome match uh, with, um, Jim John Blank, was it Jason Day? I'm trying to remember who, who it was, but the international team had a putt 
to tie, tie the Americans side on the whole. And it went well past the hole and Spieth just very nicely knocked it back while it was still in motion. Well, at the time, under the old rules, this provision didn't exist. So what was the ruling then? That the Americans were penalized for, inten for intentionally deflecting a ball in motion. You know, does that result make any sense in the world? No. And, you know, I felt really, and that was a great example of the need to apply the rules properly as written, even when, you know, deep down, you know, there made no, no sense in the world that the referee with that match and Andy McPhee with the European tour knew full well what the rules said, knew full well that result made no sense whatsoever, but he was obligated to apply the rules. And, and that's why we have a rules change cycle so that the RNA and the USGA could say, you know, that result doesn't make sense. We need to change the rule. And now this now provision's been added. But the important thing to note is it applies to a very specific uh, set of facts. When uh, the opponent uh, needs to hold, a stro hold uh, the stroke to tie, uh, to tie and the ball's deliberately deflected or stopped when there's no reasonable chance it would be hold. And in that case, there's no penalty applied. Now, do you know the history behind it? Is that something that was part of the original rule changes that they were um, talking about, or that's something yeah. that came to light? Yeah, Phil, Phil, that's a good question. I don't know if that had been under discussion before the President's Cup incident. I don't think so, but I, I could t t tell you for sure. It John, is, we have a question online, if you don't mind. Oh, asking. yes. Thank you. Um, the question is, which breach of the rule takes priority when combining a round of stroke play and match play? And an example of this would be teeing off in the wrong order and stroke is canceled in match play. Okay, which rule takes priority? Well, let's see. Well, I think we've got to look at the that section of committee procedures for that here. Let's... This is a good exercise for everyone. Turn to Rule six, Section 6C. Is that right? Yeah, Section 6C, which is on page on page 422, where. Oh, well, here we go. If we look at page 433, uh, combining match play and stroke play. Now, the combining of match play and stroke play is discouraged as certain rules are substantially different between the two formats. But there will be times where players uh, re uh, request to combine two forms of play or having done so on their own request a ruling, the committee should make its best efforts to support players at these times and should use the following guidelines in doing so. So as you know, Ken pointed out, this is a change for this year. Um, if a committee chooses to allow players to play a match when competing in a stroke play competition, it's recommended that players be advised that the rules for stroke play apply throughout. For example, no concessions are allowed, and if one player plays out of turn, the other does not have the option of recalling that stroke. And then when players request a ruling, uh, it should apply the rules as they would to each match play and stroke play separately. For example, if one player did not complete a hole for whatever reason, he or she is disqualified from stroke play, uh, so forth. So, so, I, so the key there is that if the committee allows that, then uh, it's uh, the committee is in, or it's recommended that the committee apply just the stroke play rules uh, to that. So no concessions. So if someone were to uh, play from uh, uh, to play out of turn, for example, the play, uh, opponent would not have the option to have that player recall this uh, to recall that stroke. So so as you can imagine, there could be there could be. Uh, a mess of problems, which is you know partly why the old rules did not allow that. But I think that was a, a concession to the fact that well that is happening. You know sometimes for efficiency purposes, uh, and you know we should and the rules should do what they can to offer some guidance uh, for that. So, John, yeah. 
Yeah, Tim. Bill tees off in front of the, the marker and we're playing ball, obviously. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he just smashes it right down the middle, okay. 320 yards. I have no right to, to call that back. That's yeah. But not good. Does well, he get a two-stroke penalty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah he's he's going to have a two-stroke penalty and then has to play from inside the team area. So, yeah. Match play. Yeah. Match play? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because that, that's going to be one of, one of those strange situations yeah, that... I you know, and, 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 play two balls. You know, and again, that's part of the reason that, you know, it's not encouraged that uh, uh, committees do that. But I think it was just an acknowledgement that it's happening and that's, you know, there's no point disqualifying players, but just point out the shortcomings and try to deal with it as, as best you can, realizing that's going to be an imperfect uh, uh, situation. Uh, let's see. All right, rule three point two a two, tying a hole. So a new a new term, instead of previously talking about having a hole in match play, now it's tying a hole, which is, you know, I guess you could say is more contemporary and more easily understood, perhaps. It uh, holes tied if player and opponent complete the hole in the same number of strokes, or the player and opponent agree to treat the hole as tied, as long as at least one of them. Uh, uh, teed off on the hole. So we could have a situation where let's say Tim and I are, have a match against each other and some really, really complicated situation happens on the eighth hole. And, you know, we really don't know, we don't, don't know what, it, what the right way to resolve it is. You know, we could just say, geez, Tim, this is a mess. How about if we just say the hole's tied and we go on to the next hole? Tim says, yep, sounds good to me. That, that this that this will allow players to do that uh, in that case, where you know it could be a situation where on a par three over water, uh, long par three over water into the wind, both players hit their tee shots into the water, and they say, "Geez, um, you know, we might be here a long day, and you know, we each only have, you know, th th yeah, this is this is just the second hole of the day, and we, and we only have three balls in our bag, so why don't we just consider the whole half to save, save, save our ammo?" And but that, it's, but it says here, John, that at least one player has, has made a stroke on the hole before they can begin. Yeah, and part of the reason for yeah, that is to ensure is to protect the principle of playing the round. That in other words, to avoid the case where, let's say it's a yucky day outside like today. And, you know, Tim, you and I are scheduled to play a match in our club match play championship. And we say, geez, you know, we're gonna catch pneumonia if we play a day. Why don't we just agree to consider the first 17 holes half and go to the 18th hole and that'll decide it. You, you know, that, that it's to protect uh, uh, players from being, being able to do that. So they, they're still, they still have to play, play, play the round. <laughs> All right, uh, winning, next page, winning a match. Player wins a match when the player leads the opponent by more holes than remain to be played. Or the opponent concedes the match, you know, could be, uh, uh, for example, I remember 2003 U.S. Mid-Am uh, player, uh, you know, severely hurt his ankle in ninth hole of the first round of the 36 hole final. And it was clear that he wasn't going to be able to um, uh, finish the match and he conceded it after just uh, nine holes or the player is uh, disqualified. Now extending a tied match, um, you know, this has been uh, strengthened in the rule itself before it just said, well, it's up to the committee to decide what to do. And this really, now establishes a default position. That is that if the match is tied, uh, the players will continue one hole at a time until there's a winner. It goes on to say that unless the committee says differently, you play uh, the holes in the same order as during the round. So if you start on number one, you walk off 18 tied, then you go back to number one. But sometimes the committee might say for other reasons, could be for TV reasons, spectator reasons, or course of availability reasons, no at go to the hole number 10 or something like that. But it does say, it uh, does acknowledge that the committee may say in terms of competition, 
that a tied match will simply be a tied match. And we see that all, most often in uh, team competitions, right? Like in the Ryder Cup, where if a match is tied, then each side gets half a point uh, uh, for that. Uh, the result of a match becomes final in the way stated by the committee. So something the committee uh, should uh, state beforehand. And that's something, again, note the reference in blue that the committee procedures section offers some guidance on. You know, so, some examples are when the result is recorded on an official scoreboard or other identified place. Um, you know, it could just be on the um, uh, brackets on the in the locker room, or when the result is reported to a person identified by the committee, it could be to the golf shop staff, for example. Uh, let's see, Rule Three Point Two B concessions. Well, John, can I ask yeah. a question about the previous one? Yeah. Um, a tying a hole on the previous page. It says a hole is tied, also known as half. Does the uh, does the WSGA have a preferred? term to use so if Gary Wild is doing the last match and the players uh, tie the hole is he supposed to say the match is all square or is he supposed to say the match is tied? Uh, you know Dan that's a good question I don't think the WSGA's had a formal discussion on that but my inclination would be be to use the word tied that I think that that's more easily understood and also just um, in terms of audio uh, you know hearing the word halved you know, with the silent L is awkward, you know, can, can be awkward, not is not always understood where it's just the word tied. It's easy to hear, it's easy, easily understood, and I, I'd be inclined to use tied. Uh, let's see. All right, con concession, something that applies only in uh, match play. Player may concede the opponent's next stroke, hole, or the match. So there are three things that can be conceded. Now, the most common uh, by, by far is conceding the next stroke, uh, which is allowed any time before the, that next stroke is made. Uh, the opponent has then completed the hole with a score that includes that conceded stroke and the ball may be removed uh, by anyone. So again, something, I mean, that statement's a good example of something that you know was well understood by golfers, but you know, if you were new to the sport and were just learning this, would you really understand if a stroke's been conceded what a player's score for the hole is? So, uh, so some nice uh, explicit detail there. Now, at another interesting point that the rules should address, and something that I think happens perhaps more often than we might think, and that is when a, pl uh, a concession is made while a ball is in motion. That it could be that let's say Arnold and I are playing, uh, Arnold had, hits a putt, and as it's rolling past the hole, I say, that's good. So what am I really conceding? I'm conceding his next stroke, you know, assuming that his ball doesn't make a U-turn, go, go back into the hole, <laughs> which, which is something sensible, but something that the previous rules did not uh, really uh, address that well. And the player may concede the opponent's next stroke by deflecting or stopping the ball in motion only if that's done specifically to concede the next stroke and only when there's no reasonable chance the ball can be hold. So if Arnold's ball is going past the hole on a flat green and I just reach over and knock the ball back to him, uh, that that's a way of conceding his next stroke. So if he had been putting for a three, that means you'd add his score before for the hole. Conceding a hole. This is allowed any time before the hole is completed, um, including before the players even start the hole. And conceding the match, allowed any time before the result of the match is decided, including before the players start the match. So if Dan and I have a match and I wake up and you know, my back hurts so much I can't even get out of bed. I can just call Dan and say, Dan, I, I can see. Good luck in, in the next round. All right, now, uh, again, some more information that a, a lot was taken for granted, but now was put in the rules, which will help, especially those uh, new to the game, but also it'll help um, even those that have been playing for a while. while how to make uh, concessions. 
first point is a concession is made only when clearly communicated. So if it's not made, if it was not clearly communicated, then the concession did not take place. And this can be done either verbally or by an action that clearly shows the player's intent to concede the stroke, the hole, or the match, such as making a gesture, such as motioning to the player to uh, pick up his ball. Now, if the opponent lifts his or her ball in breach of a rule because of a reasonable misunderstanding the player's statement or action was a concession of the next stroke, hole, or match, there's no penalty in the player uh, and the ball must be replaced on its original spot. So something that previously was tucked away in a decision and now there's clear authority for that and just, uh, result in uh, the rule itself. And as before, a concession is final and cannot be declined or withdrawn. All right, uh, let's see. Section 3.2C, involving handicaps in match play. Uh, the player and opponent should tell each other their handicaps before the match. If a player uh, declares the wrong handicap and does not correct the mistake before the opponent's next stroke, then uh, the consequence will depend as to uh, the nature of the um, uh, uh, wrong handicap. If the declared handicap was too high, and as a result, this affects the number of strokes uh, the player uh, would give or get, um, the player is disqualified. Now, if this is too low, then the player should shot himself in the foot and has to play out the match with the uh, low handicap. Now, where the handicap strokes hole are applied, uh, this is something that's determined by the uh, committee. Handicap strokes are given by hole and lower net score wins the hole. If a tied match is extended, handicap strokes are given by hole in the same way as during uh, the round, unless the committee tells you to do something different. So in other words, if the, first, if the match is tied, needs to uh, extend a, uh, hole by hole, and the first hole is the number seven handicap hole, then if the player gets seven or more handicap strokes, then uh, he or she will get a stroke on that hole. Now, if the players mistakenly apply handicap strokes on a hole, the agreed result of the hold stands unless the players correct that mistake in time. And we'll we'll see, see in a few minutes. Now, in match play, responsibilities of the player and opponent We'll talk about a number of strokes taken and number of, and uh, penalty and the uh, match score. So these are all in for uh, details that previously were lumped into the uh, rule formerly no, uh, uh, known as wrong information, but now we have some new terms and they're broken out more by each uh, section. Billy. <laughs> Welcome back from Florida. <laughs> what, what time do you get up this morning? Uh, three Eastern. Three yeah. Eastern. Okay. Well, that's only two here. <laughs> very, very good. Well, 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 welcome back. So we're on rule uh, three point two D. Uh, at any time during play of a hole or after the hole is completed, the opponent may ask the player for the number of strokes, um, which includes penalty strokes the player has taken. This is to allow the opponent to decide how to play the next stroke uh, and the rest of the hole or to confirm the result of the hole just complete. So again, it gives us the philosophical reason as to why this rule is, is the way it is, because in match play, knowing how your opponent stands can directly affect your own play. When asked for the number of strokes taken or when giving that information without being asked, the player must give the right number of strokes taken and a player who fails to respond to that request um, is treated as giving the wrong number of strokes taken. The player gets the general penalty, loss of hole, if he or she gives the opponent the wrong number of strokes taken unless the player corrects the mistake in time. 
So what? Uh, so what's the time window in which the player can correct the mistake? And that, so there are two types of mistakes. Either one, having given the incorrect number, whether high. Let's say if uh, Phil and I are playing, he says, John, what do you lie? And I really uh, was lying three at the time, but I told him some number other than three, whether two, four, five, or what have you. You know, or he asked me, and I. And I'm annoyed because I'm three down to him and I don't answer. <laughs> then ha how long do I have to come to my senses and provide the correct information? <laughs> well, let's see here. Uh, during the play of the hold, the player must give the right number of strokes taken before the opponent makes another stroke or takes a similar action, such as conceding uh, the next stroke or the hold. So before Phil plays, I need to uh, come clean and tell him what I like. Now, if this happens after the hole is completed, the player must give the right number of strokes taken before either one of the players uh, tees off on the next hole, or if it's the final hole, hole of the match before the result uh, of the match is final. And then an interesting uh, exception that's not diff uh, it's not uh, different than before. If a player gives the wrong number of strokes taken after a hole is completed, but this does not affect the opponent's understanding of whether the hole was one lost or tied, there is no penalty. So let's say, uh, for example, Ken and I are playing a match, and after one hole, uh, Ken, who uh, scored six on the hole, says, John, what do you make? And I said, Ken, I made four. So at that moment, what does Ken think the result of that hole was? That he lost. That he lost. And then let's say uh, we tee off on the next hole. We're walking down the next fairway. And I say, Ken, you know, I'm sorry. I miscounted. I forgot that to pitch out of the rough back there. I actually made a five on that hole. So is there any penalty in that case uh, for me, for not giving the right number of strokes. No, because with a five, what well, was still the result of the hole? I, I still won the hole. So that so that's an example of the application of that exception. All right, now the next part uh, of this rule is telling the opponent about a penalty. Now, when a player gets a penalty, player must tell the opponent as soon as reasonably possible taking into account how near the player is to the opponent and other practical factors. So let, let's say, for example, that uh, Ken's in the middle of the fairway and I'm in the woods uh, to the right, you know, 40 yards right of him and I'm in some pretty deep woods. And I, uh, let's say, when I'm getting ready to play, I accidentally nudge my ball, the ball uh, the ball moves and I, uh, well, actually let's say I, uh, to make it as extreme a case as possible, I, I cause the ball to move in, in a way that would involve a penalty stroke. And I, during my swing and I finish the swing and hit the ball. So we'll see later that that's a one stroke penalty, but then let's say Ken, as soon as he sees my ball airborne, he immediately plays. Is there any problem with the fact that I didn't tell him about that penalty before he played? No, because it wasn't reasonable for me to tell him that. But if we're in the fairway, if I, you know, near each other, then yes. Then in that case, I would need, uh, it would be reasonable for me to tell him before his stroke and I'd have to do that. Now, an uh, important part is this requirement applies even if the player does not know about the penalty. And a reminder, back to uh, rule one, because players are expected to recognize when they've breached the rule. So if the player fails to do so and does not correct that mistake before the opponent makes another stroke or takes a similar action, uh, such as a concession, the player loses the hole. Now there's an exception that there's no penalty if the opponent knew the player had a penalty, such as when the player is mm -hmm. obviously taking penalty relief. So if uh, Ken is watching me measure two club links, taking relief from a red penalty area and sees me drop a ball, I don't need to turn to him 10 feet away and say, Ken, I just uh, I incurred a penalty stroke for taking relief from this penalty area because he sees that. 
um, and it's uh, clear what I'm doing. But if it's not clear, the player needs to tell his opponent that. All right, now what about the match score? Uh, players are expected to know the match score if players mistakenly agree on a wrong match score, such as, um, let's say, Bill and I are playing and walking off the eighth green, I say, turn to Bill and say, Bill, all square. Bill says, yep. And that turns out not to be correct in whichever d direction. Okay, or, or excuse me, or I should say tied, Dan, thank you. Uh, then they may correct the match score before either player makes a stroke uh, to begin the uh, next hole, or if it's final hole before the result is final. So if we're after the eighth hole, we're walking to the ninth tee, and I say, Bill, uh, tied up. He says, yep. And then right before, now uh, let's say <laughs> Bill has the honor, he tees off. He says, oh, wait a minute, John, I actually think I'm one up. Then we can correct that mistake. But then, but if that didn't happen, if we tee off number nine, thinking that the match is tied, and then ninth fairway, Bill says, whoa, hold on there. I'm actually one up. Too bad. The match is tied. Um, because if not corrected in that time, then that wrong match score becomes the actual score. And, and that's important because if, you know, when we tee off number nine, you know, you know, whether I'm tied or whether I'm one down, that could affect how I play from ninth tee. So that's why uh, uh, that's the reason for the uh, need for the immediate uh, correction. Let's see, exception, if the player makes a timely request for a ruling and it's found that the opponent either gave wrong number of strokes taken or failed to tell the player about a penalty, the wrong match score must be corrected, which makes sense. Protecting own, own rights and interests. The player in a match should protect their own players in a match should protect their own rights and interests under rules. If the player knows or believes the opponent has breached a rule that has a penalty, the player may act on the breach or choose to ignore it. And that, and we'll go through all this, then we'll go, go through some examples. But if the player and opponent deliberately agree to ignore a breach or penalty, they know applies, both players are disqualified under rule one for deliberately agreeing to ignore the rules. If the player and opponent disagree whether one of them has breached a rule, then either one may protect his rights by asking for a ruling. All right, so let, let's go through that, and especially the first two uh, bullet points, because there can be uh, a little bit of a fine uh, line here, where let's say that uh, let's say Bill and I are playing a match, and on the fourth hole, Bill sees me under a tree, and there's a tree branch, small tree branch hanging out over my ball, and I reach down with my hands and snap that branch off so I can clearly see the ball and have a better swing. Bill sees that, and he says, geez, you know, look, I, I, I've, I won the first three holes, and I've got a short birdie putt here. I'm it's clear I'm going to go four up. You know, I don't, I'm, I, I'm, uh, it's clear I'm going to win this hole anyway. Uh, I don't need to rub salt in John's wound by telling him that he breached the rule. So I'm just not going to say anything. And then we finish out the hole and walking down the next fairway, Bill says, John, ju just so you know, for future use reference that when you're under a tree, you're not allowed to break off branches to improve the area of intended uh, stance or swing or, or line of play. And I say, oh gosh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Well, well, thanks, Bill. Now, what's the ruling there? Have he and I done anything wrong in that case? No. No, and why, why is that? He didn't deliberately agree to waive a rule. That's right, and the key here is the timing as to when Bill and I have that discussion. When we're walking down the next hole, could Bill still ask for a ruling to have a penalty applied to that previous hole? No. No. And the answer is no, because why? Because he saw what I did. He knew the facts of what I did before we teed off on that next hole. So therefore, since it's too late to apply a penalty, we're not deliberately agreeing not to apply a penalty because it's impossible for a penalty to be applied. So that would be the nice thing to do or the right way under the rules to do the nice thing. 
Now, the wrong way to do the nice thing would be if right after I did that, Bill rushed over and said, John, you're not allowed to do that. You know, when you're allowed, not allowed to break off natural objects uh, to improve your area of intended swing. And I said, gosh, Bill, you know, I'm sorry, you know, what's the penalty? And Bill says, well, normally it's a loss of whole penalty, but you know, we, we don't have to apply that now. Say, gosh, Bill, that's really, really nice of you. Thank you. Now, in that case, when that happens during play of that hole, what's the ruling? After we have that conversation, then we're just both disqualified, aren't we? Because now we've deliberately agreed to ignore, a, not to apply a penalty. Uh, so that's, it's the same conversation, but it occurs at a different spot. So uh, that's the difference between agreeing to overlook something you know, again, you can certainly overlook something without having any conversation with anybody versus uh, agreeing not to apply a penalty. And then with the last section that if, uh, if Bill says, you know, John, you're not allowed to do that, that's a penalty. I say, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have a disagreement. And then Bill can say, as we'll see later on rule 20, that he wants to get a ruling uh, on what I did about the tree branch I broke off. All right, now let's shift gears and get into stroke play and keeping in mind the very different nature uh, of stroke play where let's say, uh, you know, in match play, it's one-on-one. -on -one. In stroke play, it could be one against 155 other players. They need to make sure that at the end of the day in stroke play that all those, everything is treated equitably and that you're uh, comparing apples to apples. Uh, so we say, see in the purpose, stroke play has specific rules, especially for scorecards and holding out. Each player competes against all other players, and all players need to be treated equally under the rules. And then after the round, uh, the player and the marker have to uh, uh, return the player's scorecard. Rule 3.3a, the winner in stroke play, the player who completes all rounds in the fewest strokes is the winner. In a handicap competition, this means the fewest total net strokes. And a reminder that, you know, in any competition, the committee should state beforehand how ties will be decided because it's extremely awkward to settle that only once a tie has occurred. <laughs> Scoring in stroke play. Unlike in match play, uh, in stroke play, there is a scorecard. And the score is kept by the marker who's either identified by the committee or chosen by the player in a way proved by the committee. The player must use the same marker for the entire round unless the committee approves a change before or after it happens. So, you know, most common time that, that occurs is, let's say, if a player withdraws during the round, perhaps for injury, perhaps for uh, bad golf. Um, and the player needs to have another marker. Uh, now, what's the marker's responsibility? After each hole during the round, the marker should, it's a good idea, but it's not a requirement, confirm with the player number of strokes taken on that hole, including penalty strokes, and enter that gross score on the scorecard. Now, after the round, the marker must certify the hole scores on the scorecard, which you know, in WSGA events will mean signing the paper scorecard. Uh, if the player had done more, had more than one marker, then each marker would certify the scores for those holes. So if a player had uh, uh, person A is the marker for the front nine, person B has the marker for the back nine, then each marker would need to sign for uh, that uh, part of it. Then on the next page, you see a nice diagram with uh, color coded that does a nice job of showing, you know, what who's responsible for what. Then we start by looking at blue with the committee. The committee is responsible for issuing the scorecard. It has the player's name, has the date, and the committee is also responsible for adding up the scores and applying the handicap. Uh, the player is responsible for certifying the scorecard, in this case by signing it. Then both the player and the marker are responsible for filling out the whole by whole uh, gross scores and making sure that the marker has certified the 
uh, scorecard. All right, now the player's responsibility. And, you know, first, uh, uh, a recommendation during the round, the player should, good idea, not a requirement, keep track of his or her scores for each hole. You know, you often see, including the WSGA events and scorecards that have a little perforated strip at the top where a player can keep uh, his own score, his uh, you know, own unofficial score during the round. Now, after the round, the player should carefully check the whole scores entered by the marker, raise any issues with the committee, make sure the marker cert certifies the whole scores on the scorecard, must not change a score entered by the marker except with the marker's agreement or the committee's approval. So that's a nice uh, addition, kind of confirming uh, the common practice and must certify the whole scores on the scorecard and promptly return it to the committee, after which the player must not change the scorecard. So just as before, no changes to the scorecard after it's been returned to the committee. So if the player breaches any of these requirements, the player is disqualified. So that means that if the, and we'll see an exception here, but if the, if the player returns the scorecard without the marker's uh, signature on it, that the player and not the marker is going to be uh, penalized for that. That the player is responsible for making sure the marker's signature is on the scorecard when he returns it. But then a uh, uh, necessary exception here, that there's no penalty if the committee finds that the player's breach of, of the above rule was caused by the marker's failure to carry out his or her responsibilities such as the marker leaving with the player's scorecard or without certifying the scorecard, so long as this was beyond the player's control. And that's the important part, beyond the player's control. So for example, both the player and the marker are there inside the WSGA scoring tent, and the player ultimately returns the scorecard without the marker's sign signature on it, then the player is going to get disqualified. This exception covers a case where you have, let's say, a really hot-headed player who after his final round just doesn't shake anyone's hands immediately hops over the fence into his car and speeds away without you know handing over the, the player's scorecard then in that case you're not you can't penalize the player for that so um, that's just an acknowledgement of what's hopefully a very rare uh, uh, situation all right wrong score for whole and this uh, this is a, a change or, or one aspect of it. If the player returns a scorecard with the wrong score for any hole, uh, if the return score was higher than the actual score, then the higher return score for the hole stands. You know, best example of that, again, Roberto DiVincenzo at the 1968 Masters. He made a birdie three on the 71st hole, instead returned a scorecard with a par four for it, so he was stuck with a par four and uh, missed the playoff by one. But if the return score is lower than the actual score, or if no score is returned, if the score for the fifth hole is just blank, other than in specific competitions, um, uh, formats, then the player is disqualified. Jackie Pung. Yep, yep, J Jackie Pung in the, I think it was 1957 US <laughs> Women's Open made a six on, was it the fourth hole, but, you know, returned a score of five. There were no penalty strokes or anything. It was just a, a simple mistake. So she made a, a, a five. She made a six, but returned a five. So she would still be disqualified. Now there is a specific exception. If one or more of the player's hole scores are lower than the actual scores because he or she excluded one or more penalty strokes that the player did not know about before returning the scorecard. The player is not disqualified. And if, if the mistake is found before the close of competition, the committee would then revise the player's score by adding the penalty strokes that should have been included in the score for uh, that hole or holes under the rules. Go, and we'll go through an example of this, but let's just finish this. This exception does not apply when the excluded penalty is disqualification. 
So in other words, if you earn disqual penalty of disqualification, you will still be disqualified. Or when the player was told that a penalty might apply or was uncertain whether a penalty applied and did not raise this with the committee before returning the scorecard. So let's uh, go over um, a, a couple of examples. And uh, let's a uh, common example. Remember way, way back in 1987, Craig Stadler kneeling on a towel during the third round of the uh, tournament at San Diego. The tour became aware of this uh, breach during the fourth round. So under the old rules, what was Stadler's penalty was what? Disqualification. So if that were to happen at this year's tournament in San Diego, that he knelt on a towel to play a ball during the third round, and then during the fourth round, the committee becomes aware of this, what would the committee do? Well, for first they would talk with them and say, you knelt on a towel, did you know that that was a breach for improving the area of intense stance? He'll say, I, I had no clue, I was just trying to keep my trousers clean. All right, so in that case, what would, uh, uh, what would the penalty, what would the committee do? Well, it would take, it would add the two stroke penalty that he would incur under current rule eight and apply that to a score for that hole for the third round. And there, and that's it. And there's no additional penalty above and beyond that. Now, what would be the ruling if Stadler knelt on the player, knelt on the towel in the third round, another player said, hey, Craig, I, I don't think you can do that. You might, you might want to talk to an official. That doesn't quite seem right. He says, oh, no, no, that, that's fine. No, that's fine. And then he returns the score, and the next day the uh, committee becomes aware of this. Then what would the ruling be? Then he'd be disqualified. Why? Because of this, uh, this final uh, bullet point, because he was made aware that there could be an issue with that. And once he's made aware of it, he's then responsible to make sure that he returns the correct score for that hole, which he didn't do, so then he would be disqualified. So there's no longer a penalty for returning an incorrect scorecard? Well, I hesitate to say it in, in, in quite in those terms, because if you return an incorrect score for simple bad math, let's say there are no penalty strokes involved, let's say I have a horrible hole, I think I made an eight, so I return, my marker and I, we return an eight, but in fact, we forgot about, you know, one shot I hit in the rough that went a foot. So I actually made nine. Then I'd still be disqualified. But with the with the if my score was lower than actually taken because of a penalty because I did not include a penalty I was unaware of, then there's no penalty for returning the incorrect score. But the committee would go back and add the penalty that I should have included originally. So in the Craig Stadler case. Uh, he would wind up with a total penalty of two strokes added to a score. Well, so let's see, Thompson wouldn't happen where they walk out and say you got four penalty scores. It would only be two. Yeah. Only be two. Uh, that's all right. But the Lexi yeah, Thompson. Oh. Yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so in that case, yeah, we we did have for several years a situation where there would be the penalty the player incurred under whatever rule he or she breached plus an additional two-stroke penalty. And that additional two-stroke penalty no longer exists. Oh, yeah, yeah. And with, with Lexi Thompson, I knew, it then raises the question of going back to what we looked at under Rule 1 with reasonable judgment. You know, did, you know, did, you know, she do her best to replace that ball? And that's a discussion I'd probably prefer not to have. <laughs> and then whenever I, you know, I, I ask other people and say, well, okay, well, that's very interesting. So what would that change the outcome in Lexington Thompson case? Well, you know, let's not talk about old situations and <laughs> all that. So all right, scoring and handicap competition. The player is responsible for making sure that his or her handicap is shown on the scorecard. The player returns a scorecard without the right handicap. Well, if the handicap is too high, or if no handicap is shown, and this affects the number of strokes the player gets, the player is disqualified. Uh, but note only from the handicap competition. So if there's a gross competition as well, it makes sense for the player still to be in it. Um, 
if the handicap is, uh, on the scorecard is too low, then the net score with that lower handicap stands. Uh, the player is not responsible for adding the scores or applying the handicap. That's the committee's uh, responsibility. If the player returns a scorecard on which he or she made a mistake in adding up the scores or in applying handicap strokes, there's no penalty uh, uh, for doing so. So therefore, players shouldn't necessarily be gun shy about trying to help the committee with, uh, with math. Uh, fair to hole out, something that's an integral part of stroke play. Player must hole out at each hole in the round. If the player fails to hole out, the player must correct that mistake before making a stroke to begin another hole or for the final hole of the round before returning the scorecard. If the mistake is not corrected in that time, then the player is disqualified. And we'll see that there are a few forms of stroke play, such as Stableford, where uh, uh, players not going to be disqualified for failing to hole out. It's just that the player doesn't, in Stableford, for example, earn any points on that hole. All right, well, that is uh, rule three. Any questions on that? Yeah, Gary. Or probably more of a, a comment, but, you know, the Lexi case versus John Rahm when he moved his mark and in moving it back, obviously you can see that he did not move it back relatively close to where it was originally <coughs> and then replaced his ball and obviously he just said I thought I you know put it back accordingly but the the distance that the ball changed was no different than the Lexi uh, case like it which was. I think that it's kind of a you know, I think it you can try and put it back but obviously it wasn't. Well, to tell me more about the John Rom case, I, I don't remember that. Was that last he, year or? He, uh, yeah, last year he um, moved his mark because uh, someone else was going to play close to his mark. Okay. And in replacing, you know, we always look at a tree in the distance or whatever to replace it. When he replaces it, you can see that it definitely went closer to the hole. Hmm. And in that particular case, they interviewed him and he said I thought I you know they showed him the video he said I thought <clears throat> I had um, you know put it back to where it was originally <clears throat> which was probably more off than Lexi's case hmm. and obviously because he said he did his best um, you know he incurred no penalty Hmm. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I, I didn't remember that, but I mean, that, that's a good example, and it gets back to, I and mean, let's take a look back on page 20 about the new, um, you know, reasonable judgment rule. So that, uh, so long as the player uh, does what can be reasonably expected under the circumstances, to make an accurate determination, the player's reasonable judgment will be accepted. So it's a question of, and, it, and no pun intended, but it's kind of a judgment call by the committee. Did, did the player do what was reasonably expected in the circumstances? I mean, that's what happens in, in most of the situations that we get into um, without someone coming up and having a video of exactly yeah. what happened. You know, a, a spectator videoing something in a high school tournament, a collegiate tournament, whatever the case may be, WSJ event, anything of that nature, when it comes up and we're fact-finding, I mean, there are situations where, you know, one of the players isn't paying attention, mm -hmm. one of the players <laughs> or opponents is, and now it becomes, like he said, she said, Jim, that's good, that's good, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think that's that's a good point that that at our events, uh, in that you know deal with the golf channel didn't quite come through for this year, but maybe for 2020, I think Rob's still in negotiations with them. That uh, you know we don't have the benefit, or in some cases, some might argue the curse of uh, a television. That 
you know, you're you're out between the fifth and sixth holes, and Gary, you get called over to the third green, saying, you know, one player saying, hey, you know, so and so replaced this ball closer to the hole, blah blah blah, and and as you said, invariably, what's going to happen? One player isn't wanting anything to do with it. Right. You know, other players adamant that this player's trying to cheat. The other person acts as if you've just offended him and his family. Um, and, you know, and first and foremost, as an official, all you can do is try to piece together the facts. And it's a very difficult and awkward situation without any other evidence. When you said just one player's word against the other, and if one, all you can do is gather all evidence you can, and if at the end of the day it looks like it's a toss-up, you know, in most of the time in cases like that, you give the player, the owner of the ball, the benefit of the doubt. Um, with that, but you know, let's say situation that uh, you know is, is televised, you know that you know can add another aspect to it. And sometimes do you say, well, you know, did the player do the best that he or she could given the circumstances? You know, because one way to look at it is, um, you know, I think you know some people will say that in theory it's impossible to replace a ball on exactly where it was. That any time you're replacing a ball, you're gonna get it to some degree off. It might be a few millimeters or, or what have you. So it's a question of, is it good enough? Did you do well as well as you could, or could you clearly have done better? You know, you know that for, for example, if your dime's on the ground and you replace the ball uh, two inches in front of it, you could have done better than that, that you didn't do the best you could. But, you know, and, and unfortunately that leaves a gray area as to, what's what uh you know falls under this reasonable judgment standard uh, it, it can be tough yeah bill um to that point in our rules seminar david taylor and uh, uh oh john vanderborg were talking about how david stabler at the usga test center set up a pro you know camera that wouldn't move and had the entire rule staff mark a ball lift it clean it and replace it and also mark a ball move it with the coin and put it back and only like two percent of the time was the ball put exactly on the spot when you just marked it and lift it when it was uh, moving it with a putter head mm -hmm. never was <laughs> <laughs> and that was fascinating to know. Yeah. Well, I, I, that, that's interesting that uh, for, for those of you joining us online, Bill talked about an uh, anecdote he heard at the recent uh, PGA USGA rules class where the USGA and the test center conducted an experiment with a camera uh, locked in a certain position, and they had a number of staff come through, mark the position of lift, replace a ball, and then as well as move a ball, a putter at length to the side and replace it. And they said in terms of players just lifting the ball, uh, that two percent of the time or so it was replaced it, exactly on the right spot. And even then, part of me wonders if that's even possible <laughs> to be exactly on the spot, and that when the ball had to be moved to putter at length to the side, that really never was it replaced on the spot? So I think, you know, it helps to start from that perspective and to say, look, you know, in these cases, we're realistically never going to get it exactly right. So it's a matter of how much of a margin for error are we willing to accept, you know, in, in what the player did, is, is what the player did reasonable given the circumstances, for lack of a better term, is it good enough or could the player have done better? But that, that, that's a really, really good uh, example. Okay, anything else on uh, rule three? All right, if not here, why don't we take a 15-minute uh, uh, break and uh, Dan will uh, resume things at 10.10. Yeah, yeah, Gary. Uh, you tournament directors, the heads of our committee, wisely told us to keep a blank slate with regard to these new rules, something which is easy for me to do. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, now I've come here and I see we have two documents and in the past, when we had our rule study session, uh, we just had one book, and the, the uh, decisions book was in the form of questions and answers, and we always covered those right while we were covering a rule. 
So I guess my question to you is, what do we do with this book, and are we going to go over those at some point oh. in the future, or, or how's that? Yeah, yeah, Gary. Yeah, yeah, well, good, good question. I, in terms of what do with the. Uh, what we're calling the uh, big book, the official guide. You know, intentionally we are using the rules book because one, you know, 99% of everything that'll come up this year during our season will be covered by this. And also to help uh, help er everyone, uh, myself included, uh, become more and more familiar with, with using this book, with finding our way, way around with the format. And also because the rule, the format of the rules in here is easier to follow than the format of the rules and the official guide. And that if, for example, with the official guide, there's a format difference from last year. And it's, it's uh, interesting and helpful when you're looking for the specific interpretations, but when you're mainly focusing on the rules, it can be a little challenging. And that is that the interpretations themselves have, uh, come after each section where they apply rather than at the end of the rule. So as a result, you don't have just the entire rule by itself and then the interpretations. So every now and then you'll have like a section of a rule standing out by itself, sandwiched between some interpretations. So it's easier to read the rules in here. But Dan and I will be referring to some interpretations in here, but not as much as before for the simple reason that so much more information is now in here than, than before. And the, the interpretation format, and we'll take a minute to just talk about here, is uh, very different, that it's not the old question and answer format that you mentioned. Rather, with most interpretations, the first paragraph will simply state the principle, which in many cases is repeating what the rule says, and then it will go on to provide an example or two uh, uh, of that. So, so for now, and we're going to focus on this, but we will somewhat sparingly, and that's by intention, refer to some interpretations in here. So if you have both books, I think for each session it's worthwhile to bring both, but we're gonna spend 99% of our time with, with just the rules book. Gary, to another point, in the old rules, many of them could only be found in the decisions. And that was part of the problem that the USGA found is that they had rules that weren't in the book, they were only in the decisions, and they have tried to move everything into the rule book. And there's really no unwritten rules in the guides that there used to be in the decisions. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. So, okay, with that, that, thank you, Gary. That's uh, worthwhile uh, to go over. All right, let's well, 15 minutes. We'll resume now, let's say at uh, 10 15. <laughs> Uh, we're going to cover uh, rule four. Um, one of the things that you may or may not know is the rules are, quote, shorter than they were in 2018. And the USGA comes to that conclusion by saying they went from 34 rules down to 24, 24. rules. Uh, when we cover rule four, we're going to see that it's a combination of the old four and five. So it's pretty easy how you shrink the number of rules down is you just put two rules into the same rule. And you'll see that with the old 1617 are put into um, uh, rule 13 now. Um, the other thing is if you count the actual pages in the old rules book, counting all the dis definitions and all of the uh, rules, it was 104 pages. If you count them under the new rules book, it's 204 pages. <laughs> so basically the rules have doubled, but there's two reasons for that. One is there are a number of illustrations which are very helpful that obviously take up space and not words. And um, uh, what's the second reason? There's more words. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill reminded me what I was going to say. They have taken about 500 decisions and put them actually into the wording of the rules themselves. All right, so rule four is the old 
Rule four on clubs, rule five on equipment, and rule 14.3, which was uh, artificial devices, unusual equipment, and abnormal use of equipment. So those are now in the rule four, and that's what we're going to be discussing. Uh, before we go over the specific rule, I want to point out the uh, so there's five notable changes. Uh, I think this is on the USGA's website. And that is for each rule, they have the notable changes in that rule. And it's very helpful. If you don't have it, I know that Bill or Jeff can forward that out. It's uh, like 25 pages or something, but it's very helpful. So rule four, the notable changes. Gary Wilde is holding it up, so he has something. The notable changes are no penalty for carrying a non-conforming club, penalty only for making a stroke. That's the first change. Second change, a player may repair any damage to the club that occurred during a round. The normal course of play limitation on repair has been eliminated. A third notable change, if an adjustable feature on a club has been purposely changed, it may be restored without penalty. A fourth change, damaged ball. It could only be substituted if it's cut or cracked, no longer if it's quote, out of shape. I don't know what it means to be out of shape, but you can't, you can't have it anymore. And the last major change under rule four is rules now permit distance measuring devices. So let's look at the wording of rule four. Uh, as John pointed out, one of the nice things about the new rules is the purpose statement. Rule four covers equipment that the player may use during the round based on the principle that golf is a challenging game in which success should depend on the player's judgment, skill, or ability. So if you keep that in mind that it's based on judgment, skill, or ability, that's why you don't want the player to be able to use electronic devices that manipulate data so as to tell the player where to hit, how to hit, and so forth. Uh, 4.1 is on clubs, so we'll go over that. In making a stroke, a player must use a club that conforms to the requirements in the equipment rules. Uh, notice that it is in making a stroke. You can carry whatever clubs you want, even if they don't conform. It's the making of the stroke that triggers the penalty. A club used to make a stroke must conform not only when the club is new, but also when it has been deliberately or accidentally changed in any way. And then here's the exception. If the performance characteristics of a club, conforming, uh, conforming club changed because of where through normal use, it's still a conforming club. And there's interpretation talking about if, if the grooves of the uh, club wear down, that's okay. If the uh, shaft uh, the grip area has some indentations because you've gripped it so hard and so long that you've got a little thumb mark, that's okay. And performance characteristics means any part of the club that affects how it performs in making a stroke, such as its grip, shaft, club head, or liar loft. Uh, parent two, use or repair of clubs changed during round. This is one of the changes. If a, form, if a conforming club is damaged during a round or while play is stopped, the player normally must not replace it with another club. And then the exception, but no matter what the nature of the da damage, the club is treated as conforming for the rest of the round. So as the top of the next page points out, for the rest of the round, the player may continue to make a stroke with the damaged club or have it repaired. So if you're on the first tee, actually the first teeing area, because if you're on the first tee, it's the little device that holds the ball up. So you've got to use correct terminology. If you're on the first teeing area and you take a wild swing and you smash the front of your driver in and it, it, it's now uh, in not very good shape, you cannot repair that driver for the next 17 holes. You're stuck with that driver. However, the good news is, for what it's worth, is you can use it. 
<laughs> and this also applies if you took your driver after hitting a rather lousy shot on the first hole and you banged your driver, abused it as, as, you, as it were, on the ground and you, you bent the, the shaft and the head and it was kind of crumpled. Again, you couldn't replace it, but the good news is you can use that for the rest of the round. Uh, continuing on, you can have the club repaired. Generally, the term repaired applies to two things. The interpretations point this out. Repair generally speaks about um, an adjustable type club where the screws uh, become slightly loose. And what you're allowed to do is you, re you can repair it, which means to restore it as nearly as possible. So if it's in slot number three and it comes loose and now it's in slot number one or it's sliding around, you can put it back to three, you can't put it to any other adjustment. That's considered repair. Another example of repair is if you use uh, lead tape on your club and it uh, came detached, you could put it back on. If the lead tape would no longer stick, you are permitted to use a replacement lead tape, but again, it has to be an identical size, shape, weight, and so forth. The idea is that you are res restoring the club as nearly as possible. You're not changing it in any fashion to get a, um, an advantage. And as we talked about, damage during a round means not only making a stroke, but also stuff like taking the club in and out of the bag, and interestingly enough, abuse. So again, if you abuse your club, you break it, at least bend it, um, it is damaged during the round and you can continue to use it for the remainder of that round. So in the high school tournaments, when the kid bends his putter over his knee, last year they had to take the putter out of play and had to putt with another club. Now the player will be able to continue to use that uh, putter at least for the rest of the round. Questions on that? Um, parent three, deliberately changing club's performance characteristics during a round. A player must not make a stroke with a club whose uh, performance characteristics he or she has deliberately changed during the round. Again, the word is deliberately. Throughout the rules, that is now the buzzword. We no longer say intent, it's always deliberate or accidental. And apparently that was done for purposes of translating into foreign languages. Anyways, um, by using an adjustable feature, um, you, can't, you can't change the club by using an adjustable feature. And you also can't apply substance to the club head to affect its performing character, its performance. The exception, and this is interesting, the exception only applies to the adjustment to the club. It does not apply to adding foreign substance uh, to the club. So if you have an adjustable club and you're on the first tee, you change it, or you've made a swing, and now you're on the second hole, you adjust it from three to four, and somebody in your group says, I'm sorry, you can't do that. This exception says if you put it back to what it was, which I guess was three, you're not going to get a penalty and you can continue to use that. Notice if you take your club head and you put a substance on it, such as uh, a Vaseline or whatever they use to make the ball go straight, even if you clean it off, that club is not a qualifying or a conforming club and you're going to be disqualified if you make a stroke. So again, that adjustment, uh, the exception only applies to adjustable feature of the club. Penalty for stroke, uh, for making a stroke in breach of 4.1a. Uh, 4 and again, the thing to remember there is it's for making a stroke. If you have a non-conforming club and you don't use it, no penalty. But the last line there, the club still counts towards the 14 club rule. All right, uh, 4.1b, the so-called 14 club rule, limit of 14 clubs, sharing, adding, or replacing clubs. Player must not start a round with more than 14 or have more than 14 clubs during the round. 
if the player has fewer than 14, he can add any number up to the 14. Uh, and there are certain restrictions that we'll talk about under parent four of the clubs that he can add. When the, when the player becomes aware that he or she is in breach of this rule by having more than 14 clubs, the player must immediately, and I would underscore the word immediately, take the excess clubs out of play. And we're going to see in just a minute that if you don't do it immediately, you don't just get the two or the four penalty strokes, you're disqualified. So you're going to want to take the action immediately um, once you become aware of the uh, 14 clubs. If you start with more than 14, he or she may choose which clubs to take out of play. So if you start with 16 and you're on the third hole and Gary says, gee, uh, you got 16 clubs and you say, oh, I guess that's right. I can pick the two that I want to take out of play. If I start with uh, 14 and then I add two on the third hole and I'm caught or become aware of it, I have to take the two clubs that I added out of play. I can't take any other two. The um, last paragraph under parent one there, uh, I believe was previously in a rules decision and it's just kind of a common sense situation. It allows the player not to get a penalty if he's trying to do a good deed. Uh, after a player's round has started, if a player picks up another player's club that was left behind, or the club is mistakenly put in the player's bag without him or her knowledge, the club is not treated as one of the players. So if you see a club along the side of the fairway or alongside the green, you can pick it up and you can put it in the cart and there's not going to be a penalty. Um, Sharing of clubs. Player is limited to the clubs he or she has started with and must not make a stroke with a club being used by anyone else who was playing in the, uh, on the course. Uh, again, the emphasis there is on the word make a stroke. So although you can't share clubs, if you're between holes and you want to borrow your uh, partner's putter to, to practice on the, the last green, if that's permitted, or the teeing ground of the next tee, a teeing area, you're permitted to do that because you are not making a stroke with the club. Stroke means a stroke that is uh, a stroke that counts in the score. And then when the player becomes aware that he or she has breached this rule by having more than 14 clubs, you must immediately, and there's that word again, you have to do it immediately. And you have to use the procedure in paragraph C, which we're going to uh, look at in a little bit. Uh, the blue items, the blue language there, the, the blue wording, uh, C rules 22.5 and 23.7. Uh, we'll see when we get to 22.2, uh, .2, which is foursomes, and 23, which is four ball, that players are allowed to. Uh, share clubs. They just can't have a total of, they can't have more than 14 between them. Dan, we have a question uh, from online. Oh, go ahead. Um, the question is, what happens if you start with 15 clubs, but one is a non-conforming club, such as a weighted club, only used before the round, but never intended to be used for a swing during the round? Is it wow. considered a training aid? Uh, it's an excellent question. We'll cover it. If you can just hold off for about 10 minutes, we'll cover that. If I haven't, Jeff, remind me and I'll cover it then. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, parent three, no replacing lost or damaged clubs. We talked about this. If you, um, this, is a, this is a change. If you lose a club, uh, you can't replace it. If you start with 14 clubs, you can add up to 14. Um, but if you damage one, you can't replace it. There is an exception, and that is if it's done by someone other than you or your uh, partner or uh, caddy. So if you're uh, playing the third hole and uh, somebody from another group runs their cart across your driver and snaps it in two, the exception on the top of page 39 tells you that you can uh, replace it.
But notice that when you do replace it, the player must immediately take the damaged club out of play using the procedure, which we're going to talk about in a minute. I emphasize this because it's not enough just to get a new club. If you leave the old <coughs> club in your bag, you could be disqualified because you have not used the procedure to take it out of play. All right, restrictions on adding or replacing clubs. When adding or replacing a club under uh, 14 club rule, you must not unreasonably delay play. That makes sense. You notice that's a new term. It used to be called undue delay. It's now unreasonable delay. You cannot add or borrow a club from anyone else. Playing on the course, even if the other player is playing in a different group. And notice that it's on the course, so you could borrow a club if the player has finished the round. Also, you cannot build a club from parts uh, carried by anyone for or on behalf of the player. So the player himself cannot carry that, put the clubs together, and he cannot have somebody else go along and carry them. There is, however, make sure you understand this, there's no penalty for carrying component parts in your bag. So you could carry two extra driver heads if you wanted and two extra shafts. The problem is you can't put them together and use them during the round, but there's no penalty for the mere fact that you have carried component parts. <clears throat> All right, penalty for breach of 1.4b. Uh, uh, this is significant, we'll go through this. What's significant is this is the only adjustment penalty left in the rules of golf. John, is that correct? Okay. Um, there used to be three or four other ones. If you had a caddy, um, depends on when you had it, and you could get an adjustment penalty, uh, the one ball rule. This is now the only one uh, that is left. The penalty applies based on when the player becomes aware of the breach. If the player becomes aware of, uh, of the breach while playing the hole, the penalty is applied at the end of the hole. In match play, the player must complete the hole, apply the result, and then apply the penalty to the match. We'll go through an example. If the player becomes aware of the breach between two holes, the penalty applies to the end of the last hole. Anyone who is thinking about taking the national test, here's a little point. 4.1b, limit of 14 clubs. This is, the, this is the odd rule. Whenever you see something that says the 14 club rule, a little uh, red flag should go up uh, because it's the only adjustment penalty and it's the only time I'm aware of where a penalty between two holes is applied to the last hole rather than the next hole. John Morris uh, is thinking. John may come up with something, but as a good rule of thumb, remember that when you're on the national uh, test. Uh, the uh, penalty in match play, it's an adjustment penalty. Uh, in the example that they give, if a player who starts with 15 clubs becomes aware of a breach while playing the third hole and then wins the hole to go three up in the match, the maximum adjustment penalty is, is two holes and the player would then be only one up. Another example, you play the first hole, you lose it. You play the second hole, you lose it. Somebody looks in your bag, you got 15 clubs. Well, it wasn't your day. You're now gonna be four down and you've only played two holes. That's what an adjustment penalty is. In the stroke play part of this, it's a maximum of four strokes. So it's two strokes for each of the holes up to a maximum of four penalty strokes. All right, 4.1 uh, C. This is the procedure for taking clubs out of play. And under the 14 club rule, you are required to use this procedure. And you have to do it immediately. When a player becomes aware during a round that he or she is in breach of uh, the uh, 14 club rule uh, for having more than 14 clubs or making a stroke with another player's club, the player must immediately take an action that clearly indicates each club that is being taken out of play. 
This may be done. Notice it doesn't say these are the two exclusive methods. It simply says it may be done by either declaring this to the opponent or taking some other clear action, such as turning the club upside down in the bag. Obviously, good practice is you should do both. You should tell your opponent that you're declaring it out of play. It seems to me there's no downside to declare it out of play, then there's no, there's no uh, room for doubt. If you just turn it upside down, it could be questioned, you know, why did you do that? Maybe you didn't take it out of play. Player must not make a stroke for the rest of the round with any club taken out of play. <clears throat> to take, if the club is taken out of play, there's another player's club, that other player can still use it. Obviously, if you're on the tee, you reach into somebody else's bag and you use his driver, you've now breached the 14 club rule, but that doesn't stop the person who was innocent from getting his driver back and using it. That's what that's saying. The, uh, the last part before a round, and this is going to get to the question that, that Jeff asked, this uh, parent two before a round used to be in a rules decision. Prior to 2016, if you got to the first tee with 15 clubs, discovered that you had 15 clubs, took one of the clubs out, put it on the floor of your golf cart, and started the round, you breached the rule because you, quote, started the round with more than 14 clubs. That was uniformly hated, that decision. 2016, they put in the precursor to this in a decision, and it is now slightly changed, and it is now part of the rules. Um, and again, that, that is one of the things that the USGA and the RNA should be most uh, proud of, is the fact that they got rid of many of the decisions and put them into the rules themselves. So that's why, in theory, you should only have to know the rules and not the decisions. So let's look at it. If a player becomes aware, shortly before starting a round, that he or she accidentally, that's the key word, has more than 14 clubs, the player should try and leave it behind. But as an option without penalty, the player may take the excess club out of play before the start of the round, using the procedure above, and the excess club may be kept by the player but not be used. If a player deliberately bling, brings more than 14 clubs, then this does not apply. So take an example. You're on the range, you got 15 clubs, you're trying to decide which driver, all of a sudden it's your tee time, you go up to the first teeing area and you say, oh, I haven't, I made a mistake, I forgot to take one out. This is allowing you to take the club out declare it unplayable, but still carry it in the golf cart or even in your golf bag for the rest of the round. But notice the word accidental versus deliberate. If you're on the range, you have 16 clubs, you know you have 16 clubs, you say, I'm gonna to go to the first tee and when I get there, I'm gonna make my decision. So you go to the first teeing area and you still, you're undecided and finally you say, oh, I'm gonna use this driver. This does not apply. So what this means is you've started the round with more than 14 clubs. Now, I believe the question online was, a person starts with 14 clubs and has a non-conforming club such as a Medicus in the bag. That Medicus is a non-conforming club. However, it counts towards the 14 club rule. So the player would in fact get a penalty for having more than 14 clubs. I, I think that was Jeff's question, wasn't it? Correct. Any questions on 14-1 with clubs? Yeah, John. I'm a little bit confused because it says uh, if you look at 4.1C1, it says if the club taken out of play is another player's club, that other player may continue to use the club. Yes. Does that insinuate that they have to be in your group? Uh, no. That just means if you, if a club's taken out of play, you have to take out any club. If you have 14 clubs and you use another club, you have now taken 15 clubs. You've violated that rule, and so you can't use it. 
if it's somebody else's club, the other person isn't going to get penalized. He can, of course, use his club. If you found a player's club on the court, subsequently used that club, that would be a, you know, when you started with 14, you found the club, used it, you'd be in breach of the 14 club rule. You would take that club out of play, and if the rightful owner then wants, you know, you found out whose club it was, that player could then use that club. So that's different than the result we arrived at at Pine Hills with Nader um, Laku when someone else picked up his club on the putting green and started the round with it. Nader found the other gentleman's club and left it at the clubhouse. But when we found it, when the, when the other player turned it in, we told Nader that he could no longer use that club because it had been put in play by someone else. Does that change under this? Do you remember that? It was a time heels. Uh, I, I don't, I wasn't part of that incident. I don't remember that incident. If you start with, with your clubs and someone has, during that round, used your club, that does not affect your ability to use it, even though they are required to declare it out of play. What are you saying that's happened before the round? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the player started with four, his 14 clubs and then another player's club wound up in his bag? No, what, what he did is he picked up the wrong club on the putting green, put it in his bag so he had no more than 14, but one uh -oh. of them was not his. Nader found the other club, turned it in, and subsequently, we located his club, but when we returned it to him, we told him he could not use it. All right, let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can uh, spell that out for the people listening online. A player uh, has 14 clubs just before he's going to start. One of them is, is he's putting with on the putting green, and by mistake, he picks up the wrong putter. So he has now started with 14 clubs. He is not in breach of the 14 club rule. However, one of those clubs is not his. The player who then is about to start the, the round now has his original 13 clubs plus a putter of another player. And he wants to be able to use the putter of the player who has already started the round. I think that's the question. And the question, before the round, he didn't start with the 13 clubs. He only had 13 clubs in his bag. He turned it into the pro shop. <laughs> so I guess I'm, I guess I'm not sure. If he started with only 13 clubs, obviously he can add one more. Except that we told him he could not use it because it had been put in play by someone else. Playing on the course. Of course. Yes, and that's still the rule. That's still the rule in spite of what it says here? Yes, that's how I read it. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you cannot, and it, this is, this is you, you, and this is under four on the restrictions of what club you can add. If you look on uh, page 39, it says restrictions, you cannot add or borrow any club from anyone else who is playing on the course. Even if it belongs to you. <laughs> Uh, yes. The rule says what it says. Add or borrow <laughs> any club. Check your bag. 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 club, that other player may continue to use the club. Mm -hmm. Continue that is so that is so yeah. you started with it. Yeah, yeah, lost yeah, it exactly. somewhere yeah. in right. lost it somewhere in like transit. Yeah, I think that That's really so contemplates a case where, you know, let's say John, you and I are sharing a cart and we have the same irons, and by accident I put my six iron in your bag, then you pull it out, you make a stroke with it, and you realize, oh gosh, I just used John's six iron. Then you know you have to declare my six iron out of play, but then I can use that six iron again. But if you had started the round with his six iron mm -hmm. and, senior bag. and you only had 14 clubs, isn't it a different answer? Yeah, like that? yeah, yeah. That, that it's different yeah. when, when you start a round and for lack of a 
and those are kind of considered your clubs. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is the reason. I, I don't remember. <laughs> starting the round is usually this might be the dumbest question you'll hear all day. Starting the round is when you make a stroke off the team. Yes. Gonna and we're going to find out. Next we're going to find out on the next group. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Uh, yep, this yep. rule was written for players who start around in a golf cart. Now I show up on the first tee with 15 clubs in my bag, and I have a caddy, or I'm carrying my own bag. And I realize that I have too many clubs, and I want to take a club out and declare and declare that I'm not, but I don't want to leave it on the first tee. Right. What are my options? Well, that's what that's what parent two before the round is all about. Um, you have to declare it out of play. I understand. But then you can you can put it in your golf bag. A driver. Yes. Oh, yes. I can leave the driver in my bag with the head with the. You you have to you have to take it out of play using the procedure in sub one that we just went over, which means you must either declare this to the opponent or take some other clear action, such as turning it upside down. Okay. So that's so in that's stroke what, play, I would announce to my marker or my fellow competitors that I'm not using. The title is driver, I'm using. Paper. Yes, and to be clear, you would say, and I'm specifically declaring the title is driver out of play, because then you've now complied with the procedure of, okay. of sub C. All right. Uh, Dan, we, Dan, we have a quick question from Charles online. Um, he's wondering if a training aid such as an orange whip is considered as a club and to be a part of the allowable 14? Uh, it is not, and neither is a, um, neither is a, um, no, 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 ne neither is an alignment rod. Um, it's a training. It's a training aid. And we'll get to that later on about whether you can actually use it, but there's no prohibition about carrying it, <laughs> and it's yeah. not a, quote, conforming club. It's not a non-conforming club, because it's not a club. All right, 4.2 uh, balls. Short rule. 4.2a, balls allowed in play of round. In making each stroke, a player must use a ball that conforms to the requirements of the equipment rule. A player may get a conforming ball from anyone on the court. So you can borrow a ball from anyone, unlike clubs, which you cannot borrow from anyone. And the conforming ball, you're only going to get a penalty if you make a stroke with, with a non-conforming ball that counts in your score. So you're on the tee, you hit one what you think is out of bounds, you go to your bag, you get another ball, you tee it up, and you hit it right down the middle, and that ball that you just hit is a non-conforming ball. If you find your original ball inbounds and on the course, you get no penalty. If you don't find it, you're disqualified. Deliberately altering, altering a ball must not be played, such as uh, scuffing it or heating it. There's also no procedure to undo the scuffing or undo the heating. So if you heat it up and you then wait for it to get the room temperature, Seems to me you can't use it because it's been deliberately altered. By the way, it's a proven fact that heating the ball does not change the uh, characteristics of it. And Gary Wilde has just informed us that heating a ball does not change the characteristics. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, should I send you the heating information? They actually, they actually mentioned that at the rules. Yeah, it doesn't work. I remember the test center used to have this display. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Or maybe I was just about wind. Maybe it wasn't temperature. Um, wind definitely. No, so, so a ball that's 20 degrees that's been sitting out in the car will go just as far as a ball that's 80 degrees. Yep. Yeah, it conforms really? real quickly to the temperature from the time that you try heating it up in your pocket with whatever or in your bag. 
For those online, we've just had an intellectual discussion about what heating a ball does, whether it does or does not improve. Whether it does or does not improve, you cannot do it. All right, let's move on to 4.2b. Ball breaks into pieces while playing a hole. The ball breaks into pieces after a stroke. There is no penalty and the stroke does not count. Notice that it does not say the stroke is canceled. It says the stroke does not count. This was one of the nice changes in the new rules is elimination of the word cancellation when it is really a quote automatic cancellation. Under the old rules, if it was a match play situation, there were certain times when you could cancel a stroke, such as the ball being played from outside the team area. Under the old rules, you also could cancel a stroke if it was automatically canceled uh, in certain circumstances, such as you're on the putting green and uh, uh, you hit an animal when you putt, or such as the ball breaking into pieces. Under the new rules, the, the correct term is now the stroke does not count, and that takes the place of the old term automatic cancellation. 4.2c, <clears throat> ball becomes cut or cracked while playing hole. This is another nice change in the rules. They have headings and titles to sections and subsections that sort of clearly tell you what is going on in that rule. So notice that it says ball becomes cut or cracked while playing hole. The old term was unfit for play. And then you had to look up a definition and figure out what unfit for play was. Now it's saying a ball becomes cut or cracked while playing a hole. So that's all this rule is talking about is a ball that's cut or cracked. So, uh, parent one, lifting ball to see if it's cut or cracked. If a player reasonably believes that his or her ball has been cut or cracked while playing a hole, the player may lift the ball to look at it but the spot of the ball must first be marked and the ball must not be cleaned except on the putting green. Notice what is not in this requirement is the requirement to announce and let your fellow uh, competitor or uh, um, opponent observe. You don't have to do this anymore. This is one of the changes and the theory is it's to conform with the other relief rules where you're not required to announce to anybody else what you're doing. So if your ball is on a cart path, historically you did not need to announce, and you still don't, that you're taking relief. It may be good practice to do so, but you don't have to. This new rule is saying, 4.2c, uh, that if you were gonna pick it up to see if it's cut or crack, you do not have to announce. Do you still have to hold it? This used to hold true, maybe it doesn't hold true anymore, but where you have to pick the ball up and put it back down exactly the, the way it was. Let's say you, you've got some mud on the ball and because you don't want to, you want to put it down differently, you can't do that, can you? You have to, or, or is that no longer the case where you have to pick, pick your ball up and put it down exactly the way the ball was? When you picked it up? Uh, the short answer is that you must replace the ball. And we're going to see that in a minute. The longer answer is l later on in this presentation, in fact, I think John's covering rule 14, he's going to talk about replacing a ball. The slightly shorter answer than the real long answer is you cannot set it directly on the mud if it was on the mud before because you have not put it back in the correct place because place requires a vertical, one of the components is the vertical component. So if that throws you off, wait until rule 14 and John will explain that in greater detail. <laughs> so Bob's quite excited for the presentation. Yeah, John. Does that now mean that you cannot clean it at any fashion to determine whether it's cracked? Because it says it must not be cleaned. Um, you have to be able, well, that's a good question. If you, if there is a spot of mud 
and you think that there is a cut underneath it, this rule is saying that you cannot clean it. And we're going to see when we get to the next page the, when you can substitute. And that's, I think, will answer your question, John. When, but substituting has nothing to do with cleaning. Yeah. Hold that question for one second until we get to the next page. The, there are two other times in the rules in which the announcement and the let observe has gone away. This is bonus time. Anybody know the other two? ID. Yes. Rule 7.3, when you are trying to identify the ball. And what's the other one? When you're lifting ball to see if it lies in the condition where relief is allowed, that's 16.4. All right. So let's go on to uh, the next uh, page, parent two. And hopefully this will answer John's question. The player may only substitute another ball if it can be clearly seen that the original ball is cut or cracked. So I am playing a match against John. I'm on the 14th hole at Aaron Hills. I hit it up to the putting green. I look down. I see my ball is cracked. I pick it up. I throw it as far as I can into the penalty area at the bottom of 14. And I substitute a ball. Any penalty on me for doing that? No. no. Why? Because it can be clearly seen that the original ball is cut or cracked. So now let's talk about John's question. John picks up his ball because he thinks it may be cut or cracked. He cannot clearly see that it is cut or cracked. But there is a huge spot of mud, and he has a sneaking suspicion that underneath that mud is a cut or a crack. Can you clean it off to determine whether it's cut or cracked? My reading of the rule would say, no, no. you cannot. John, do you disagree? No, oh, I, 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 I agree. And, and that's, that's not, not a change. So that's, that's the way it was before as well. Well, how about okay. the question that you, you, know, you, you get up to the green, you take a look at it, you throw it in the water. You, know, you can't, can't be reviewed anymore. Right. Don't you have some responsibility to your fellow competitors? I mean, anybody can go up, maybe he hits a cart path, gets a little scratch, get up there and just throw it away. And, uh, well, I, I guess one way to look at it, Jim. Well, you see these pros on the tour, my God, when they, they think their ball has a slightest little blemish on it, they, they have kind of a heart attack. And this would yeah. just kind of eliminate that. Yeah, well, I mean, just well, the damn I, thing I mean, in the water. You're right, but it, it doesn't happen much when the no. balls are cut or cracked. But it's a little bit like, you know, let's say you and I are playing, I'm way off in the rough, and you see me lift a ball and drop it. You're like, you know, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, oh, well, there's some uh, temporary water, a puddle of temporary water over here. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to take my word for it, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, you know, what if you say, oh, I don't believe it. I want to come see it. And there is it there, but you don't know for sure if I was close enough to have interference. Um, and remember, player integrity is, uh, yeah. is the hallmark of the rules. No, exactly. The player has the... Well, things you read, on the, you know, about the tour players, <clears throat> you know, getting all upset and one guy says that ball isn't cracked and now you got an argument well that's what i, I guess that's what makes me suspicious but, uh, if there's an argument and you still have the ball then that's why you well, you call the, the the referee over but the rule does not require anyone else to see it it says if it can be clearly seen that the original ball is cut or cracked i would also argue that even under the old rule where you had to bring in an opponent and that player fellow competitor rarely So that guy will say the same thing back to you. <laughs> All right. So what happens if you pick the ball up? You then have to put the original. Uh, if the original ball is cut or cracked, the player must replace either another ball or the original ball on the spot. And it has a reference to 14.2. We're going to see when we get to 14.2 that the reference to 14.2 is the reference to replace the ball. Sometimes you will see and that, and that you must uh, 
play it and you'll see a reference to 14.6. When you see a reference to 14.6, that means that you have to play the stroke from where the previous stroke was made. And the difference is probably going to be whether you're going to have to drop the ball or whether you're going to replace it. All right, any questions on balls? <coughs> okay, 4.3, equipment or use of equipment. And again, the, the title of the rule is very helpful to figure out what is in the rule. It doesn't say equipment, it says use of equipment. This rule only covers how equipment is used. It does not limit the equipment that a player may have with him or her during a round. 4.3a. A player may use equipment to help his or her play during a round, except that the player must not create a potential advantage by. So in other words, the structure of this is you can use any, you can use any equipment you want, except you can't one, you can't use one that creates a potential advantage in one of these two ways. Bullet point number one, using equipment other than a club or a ball that artificially eliminates or reduces the need for skill or judgment that is essential to the game. And we'll go over some of those. Or uses equipment, including a club or a ball, in an abnormal way in making a stroke. And notice the word in making a stroke. So an example of that, under the old rules, there was a, rule, a couple of rules decisions the person is on the putting green, he puts a ball against the, the handle of his uh, putter to grip, and he makes a couple of practice strokes. Any penalty? No. Why? Because he has not made a stroke that counts in the player's score. The next rule decision said, under the old rules, however, if he uses that uh, ball to make the against the club head, to then make the stroke that counts in the, in the score, the player is going to get the penalty. And that's what this is saying, uh, using equipment in, in an abnormal way in making a stroke. All right, so we're going to go through these um, six, and I can tell you that these have been changed numerous times from when it, the rules were originally given to the public in March of 2017. And I think this has been the hardest for the, uh, the drafter of the rules to come to agreement on what to do. This rule does not affect the application of any other rule that limit actions a player is allowed to take with the club, such as setting down a club or other object to help line up. And there's a reference to a rule 10. We're going to see under rule 10 that you can't place a, a club down uh, when you're taking a stance. All right, so common examples. And this is the use of equipment. It looks number one, distance and directional information. This is a change in the rules. They've changed the default provision to specifically allow a distance measuring device at any time. And you'll see that the blue language, uh, three or four lines down, the committee may adopt a local rule prohibiting the use of distance measuring devices. This rule is a very good change, but it will have no effect at all on any tournament that's played anywhere. Because if you wanted to allow it, you would then write a local rule that says you can allow it. If you were on the PGA Tour, LPGA Tour, maybe elite amateurs, they wouldn't allow distance measuring. The problem with the old rule is it could be a trap for committees who were not as careful as Bill and Jeff are, and they don't put it on their hard card, and they could run into a situation where the rules prohibit it. Now, we've turned it 180 degrees so that distance measuring devices are allowed unless a local rule prohibits it. Um, not allowed. Measuring elevation changes. Uh, so-called slope. The couple of rules decisions under the old rules were that you could plumb line with your club by holding it up 
but you could not plumb line by holding a weight uh, with a, a string with the weight at the end, or you couldn't put a soda bottle uh, or a bottle of water on the putting green to see which way it slopes. Those are still part of the, uh, those have effectively been adopted with this language that you cannot measure elevation changes. And of course, you can't use the equipment, the distance measuring vice that has a slope feature that says it's 157 to the whole, but it's playing 164 because of the elevation. Unless you write it in your garbage book. <laughs> well, exactly what that from what it is to the middle of the green. Yes, Gary and makes a good point it. about the distinction between using equipment to get to the result and using your skill, knowledge, and so forth to get to that result. You could go on a practice round, shoot the pin at 157, look at your slope and say it's 167. So I know that this is an uphill of uh, 10 degrees. Then when you get to the course, you then measure where the pin in it, if it's 150, you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add 10 yards. Notice that you have not used equipment during the round to do that. You have just used your own judgment and skill based on your knowledge of, of how golf is played and um, so forth. All right, number two, information on wind and other weather information. So you can use equipment to measure and get information on wind and weather conditions. So you open up your iPhone when you get to the course and it says it's 72 degrees, the wind is north northwest, uh, it's five miles an hour, the dew point is 28, blah, blah, blah. You can do all of that stuff at the course and you can measure that with an iPhone. Or During the smart. Run. Yes. And interestingly enough, when you get to the course, you can actually take out a thermometer if you don't believe your iPhone, and you can hold it up and say, ah, yes, it is 72 degrees. Now we don't care because of the weather. <laughs> 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 Who cares? Temperature. Not, not, not. There you go. And what are you not allowed to do? You cannot measure wind speed. What that means is you can hold up your iPhone and you can look and it says the wind speed is 15 miles an hour. What you can't do is that you can't take a little handheld device or other device, hold it up that blows the wind through it and then say, oh, it's 15 degrees. It may be a distinction without a difference, but you are permitted to look at weather conditions and weather reports. Say that again. You can use the iPhone to get the same information that you can't use older technology to, to get this? No, measure, yes. measure, well, measure, measure. The, the iPhone the is iPhone measuring from the airport, which right. is 15 miles away or 30 right. miles away, That's as a, opposed to at the course. That's right. One is and reporting. you can, one is measuring. Right. We can report, not measure. Well, with regard to temperature. Right. And humidity. right. Also on a number two, uh, uh, not allowed, and that is using an artificial object to get other wind-related information, such as using powder to assess wind direction. So the player is in the middle of the fairway, he wants to know which way the wind blows, he picks up some grass and he throws it up and it shows that it's going from left to right. Is that permissible? Yes. Yeah. Instead, he gets a little powder and he throws it up that's not permissible and he's going to get a penalty for that. The difference between is one is artificial and one is uh, non-artificial. Um, can you throw sand? Is sand an artificial object? I would say no, it is not an artificial object. So you take a handkerchief out of your pocket to test the wind. Can you do that? Is a handkerchief an artificial object? Yes. yes. Are you doing it to get other wind-related information? Yes. Therefore, you can't do that. If the out-of-bounds marker, the chalk, say it's chalk, um, 
and, and there's a, a clump of it, and you go to go to the white out of bounds marker, pick that up and throw it up. And see. I would read the word artificial object to mean that chalk is at one time it's in a natural state, but it's like uh, it's like there's been loose impediments and a, a movable obstruction that once you go through the construction process of making them no longer natural, they are now artificial. So I would say chalk is an artificial device. It's no different than throwing up uh, powder to assist. So if I put talcum on my hands and then clap my hands and <laughs> <laughs> my um, it says using artificial object to get other wind related information. So I would say it is a penalty if in fact you're doing it for the purpose of seeing which way the wind goes. If you're not doing it for that purpose, there is no penalty. You all be pleased to know Bill Linneman agrees with that. Right. Oh, I'm just right. So that's exactly how I was explaining class. Is that it depends on how you are yeah, using okay. Um, <coughs> three. Three, thank you. Uh, <laughs> information gathered before and during the round. The way to think of this is the predicate here is the use of information the use of equipment for information gathered before or between the rounds. And basically what three is saying under the allowed is you can gather any information you want in any manner before the round and then you can use that information during the round and you can gather any information during the round as long as you don't use it during the round and you can use it after the round for analysis. What you can't do, and this is what we're going to talk about is on the top of the next page, is you can't both gather it and use it during the same round. So you couldn't, for instance, use a, an app on a phone that allows you to enter um, I don't know, how far you are for each shot, what stroke you use, the, the humidity, and then when you get to the ninth hole, you push it and you say, I'm 150 yards out, and it says, oh, now you use the eight iron, not the seven iron. That's the equipment that you can't use that is prohibited by the uh, parent three. Also, it says using physiological information, for instance, blood pressure, pulse, that sort of stuff. You can't use equipment that measures it during the round and then uses it during that round. Can you use your finger to check your pulse? Yes, because your finger is not equipment. <coughs> um, four. <laughs> Audio and visual um, allowed. You can listen to audio or watch video on matters unrelated to the competition. That makes sense. Here's where it gets a little troublesome, such as a news report, which is fine, or background music. When we get to the not allowed, it says listen to music or other audio to eliminate distractions to help with the swing tempo. Why is the person listening to background music? If he's listening it to get, uh, to eliminate distractions or help with swing tempo, you can't do it. If he's using it just to listen to background music, I guess he can. How are you gonna know the difference? I don't know. Bill, how are we gonna know the difference? Uh, ask, and, and honestly, we have two or three players that play in our senior tour events that bring the wireless speakers and I, I would never worry about any of them listening to music. <laughs> but I, I'm glad they're now allowed because there are a fair amount of people that do this. And I've always held that if it bothers one person, whether it be in your group or on the course, 
it's being turned it leads down it's not off but it's for this generation it's probably unacceptable but to the younger crowd it's as common as you can't even imagine <laughs> are you so old uh, Your butts covered someplace else. <laughs> more mature. Uh, no, this would be this would be covered here. The question was, are our earbuds covered anywhere else? And I said, no, they're covered by this rule. It's the same thing. If you're using earbuds that have uh, music to help eliminate distraction or or work with swim tempo, you can't use them. We were told that earbuds can never be used because they do eliminate distraction. Is that how you would see it? They said that at the workshop. No, really. <laughs> no government. Well, but if you're using the earbuds for back mu background music, it, it seems to me it's it's expressly permitted. It doesn't say um, background music only through the normal airways. That's how I would look at it. But yeah, that's interesting. And there is no, as of yet, there is no interpretation on this that deals with this issue. Um, the other thing that's not allowed under under four is viewing video showing play of a player or other players during the competition that helps the player in choosing a club. So what you can't do is that you can't go to 12 at Augusta, pull out your iPhone, listen to Jim Nance say that when uh, Rory McIntyre, McIlroy uh, was on this hole, he used his seven iron. You're permitted. You're you're prohibited from doing that. However, if there is a large screen TV sitting up there, and it is being shown to the spectators on the course, you are permitted to watch it. So you get to the twelfth, and you see, oh, they're talking about uh, Rory and what he hit. And so you listen, and he used his seven iron, and Jim Nance says that he was short, and he had wished he had used his six. So then you decide that well, maybe you're going to use your six. That is permitted, and the reason is because there's no way to effectively not allow it, because otherwise you would tell a player when he gets to the 12th hole that you can't watch the screen or you can't hear anything. How do you make a stroke with your fingers in your ear and your eyes closed? So that's the, that's the reason for this. Um, gloves and gripping agents. This was under the old rules. There's not much change there. You can use plain gloves. You can use resin powder, and you can wrap a, a handkerchief. So you can't use the handkerchief to check for wind, but you can do it for a lot for gripping purposes. And you can't use gloves that uh, I haven't seen them. But if a glove has a little groove on it where you put your fingers, that would not be a plain glove. But your standard uh, golf clubs are permitted. All right, the last one is six stretching devices and training or swing aids. This is admittedly uh, a little confusing on the way it is written. Here's how you need to think about this it is not that you can't use. An alignment rod. It's not that you can't use a way to donut. It's the reason that you're using those pieces of equipment. So if you look at the not allowed, it says using any type of training aid or swing aid. And then if you just skip down, that creates a potential advantage by helping the player in preparing for and making a stroke such as swing, plane, grip, alignment, ball position. So what that is saying is you can take out an alignment rod under <coughs> bullet point number one and use it to stretch with. You can take out a, a donut, instead of putting it on your club for a swing aid, you can take it and you can stretch with it. Those are permitted, but you cannot put the donut over a club and then make a swing nor can you take the alignment rod and put it under your arms for purposes of checking your swing plane or your alignment. 
Similarly, you can't use a non-conforming club to make a practice swing that creates a potential advantage to help the player in making a stroke. What does that mean? That means basically you can't use something like a medicus if you're doing it to swing with because that would be a potential advantage in helping the player make a stroke. It helps to smooth out the swing. You could take the medicus out, put it behind your shoulders and stretch with it. And since we're on this topic of alignment aids, this is my wonderful story of the day. The first time I was ever a rules official, Bill Lenneman asked me to show up at the women's public links course, uh, public links tournament in Washington County. And on the 15th hole, one of the top women in the state missed a putt on the 14th hole. She took the alignment rod out when she got to the 15th tee, put it under her arms to, to uh, simulate a swing to try and line it up. Uh, Jason Lee and I were there and we both looked at each other and we both said, you know, 14-3 slash 10.3 of the old decision seemed to prohibit this. So we called Bill and Bill said, well, yeah, it could be, yeah, but you know, she, she was the top player in the tournament and so forth. So we told her that it could be a potential penalty, but we would decide after the round. We then finished the round and as fortune would have it or not have it, there were two qualifying spots and she was tied for the last qualifying spot. So we had a playoff and as fortune would have it, she won the playoff. So now she's in the tournament unless she's disqualified. So Bill called us in and you know, we looked at the rule and the old 14.3, uh, 10.3 seemed to be pretty clear that if you use an alignment rod in that matter, you're disqualified. Um, Bill said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk to the smartest rules guy at the USGA, and if he says you're disqualified, you're disqualified. And I said to Bill, basically, well, Bill, the rule says what it says. Yeah, but if this guy says it says that, then that's, that's something. And I said, okay, who is this guy? And Bill said, his name's John Morris. <laughs> And that was the first time I'd ever heard the name John Morissette. And I was pleased to find out that John could read the English language and confirmed for Bill and I that, yes, this young lady was disqualified because she used an alignment rod for purpose of a swing plane. And that's still the, the rule under the new rules is that you could not use that alignment rod uh, to, to put under your armpits to, to simulate a stroke because it's helping with the stroke in the plane but you can use it to stretch. Gary. I brought this up once before, but it, it still would be permissible uh, to use the alignment rod, which is shorter than the driver in my golf bag, to measure for a drop so you don't get the clubs, club grips wet and dirty. It yeah, the, there's no, it would not matter. the equipment rule is, again, it, you have to keep in mind that it is to create a potential advantage by helping with the swing. And this is not, if you use an alignment rod in that fashion, it would not do that. To your point, the length of the club, the club length is the longest club in your bag, except for a putter. So you can use whatever you want, but the club length is the longest club in your bag, except for a putter, period. Is that how you see it, John? Yeah, yes. I, I, the way I look at it is, you know, the club length is, it's a certain measurement in your bag, it, it might be 44 and a quarter inches. So whatever you use to measure 44 and a quarter inches is, is okay. You don't have to use anything. Yeah. Right. You just have to get it right. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. When, when you have to drop within a club length, no other than the putter, that just means that you must drop, as John said, within 43.6 inches. And however you get it there, you get it there. If you don't get it there, you don't get it there. All right, a couple more things. Uh, equipment used for medical reasons. Player's not in breach if he has a medical reason to use the equipment and the committee decides that it does not give the, un the player an unfair advantage. So PGA Tour wraps tape around his finger. 
is that permissible? And the answer is it depends on why he wraps it around his finger. If he wraps it around his finger for a medical reason, to prevent blisters, uh, maybe you already have one there so it doesn't get worse, you're okay. But you can't do it if you're doing it to help you grip the club better, more strongly, or whatever. The other thing that's interesting about tape, and this is sub two, the player may use adhesive tape or similar covering for any medical reason, but the tape or covering must not, A, be applied excessively or help the player more than necessary for medical reasons, i.e. can't mobilize a joint. One of the interesting things, and you see this a lot on the LPGA Tour, is the use of the kinesius, I think that's what it's called, kinesius tape. And you can decide for yourself whether you think it's applied excessively or not, but there are some players that use a good deal of it. And I've even some, seen some that go actually over the elbow. That was just, you take it from the shoulder, you take it down over the elbow, almost up to the wrist. Well, if it's done for immobilizing a joint, you can't do it. If it's there for muscle control and a medical issue, then I guess you, I guess you can. And the beauty of all of the equipment stuff is no one in this room other than Bill and Jeff have to worry about it. Because at the end of the day, it's their call, not ours. Right, Bill? Um, no, I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we would make that call jointly. We would all have a say in the matter, at least. All right, let's talk about the penalty for 4.3. And this is significant because this, is, this comes up throughout the rules. Penalty for breach of 4.3. Penalty for first breach from single act or related acts, general penalty. Penalty for second breach unrelated to first breach, disqualification. I want to go through a couple of examples, but the concern I have with the way this is written is the word related is used in two different contexts. It's used to modify the word acts in the first, and then it's modified, it's used to modify breach in the second. Let me give you some examples. Player, a penalty for first breach from a single act. Person is on the, is on a, uh, in the middle of the fairway, they're waiting to play their shot, they take out an alignment rod, they put it under their, uh, their shoulders uh, to swing. Well, that's the first breach. Or, and then the player goes back to their bag, they put it back, they say, huh, I guess I, guess I, I better go do that again. And so they go and they do it again. That is a, no longer a single act, but it's a related act because it's the same thing. The reason that it moves into the disqualification penalty is if you have an intervening event or the acts themselves are not related. Give an example. So the person uses the, uh, the swing aid, the alignment rod under their arms. They then make a stroke. They use it again. There's been an intervening event. And the intervening event is the stroke. They're disqualified. If the person uses a uh, alignment rod under their arms and then decides since they got nothing better to do they pull out their wing, wind gauge to measure the wind at the course <laughs> they have now committed a second breach that is unrelated to the first even though there hasn't been an intervening event the player is going to be disqualified because those acts were unrelated and the last sentence of four says this penalty applies even if the nature of the breach was entirely different than the breach resulting in the first breach, or first penalty. So the way I, this is not the way it's written, but the way I remember what this difference is, when you read the word, words penalty for first breach from single act or related act, I then add the phrase provided there is no intervening event. When you read the second pe uh, penalty section, it says penalty for second breach unrelated to first breach, I would then add either because it's an unrelated act or it was a related act separated by an intervening event. 
So what kicks it into the disqualification is the acts themselves are unrelated or there's been an intervening event between the first time and the second time. And putting it in the bag and then taking it out and doing it again? Is that intervening right? event, there's an interpretation under, under uh, Rule 1.3. Uh, it's worth looking at. I think it's 1.3C4-1 that says uh, an intervening event is making a stroke, putting a ball into play, or becoming aware that it's a potential breach. So if someone puts a, a, a donut on and makes a swing, and then the other person says, well, I don't think you can do that. And the person says, well, I think I can. And they do it a second time, they're disqualified because there was an intervening event. It could yeah. be also so, something like measuring slope with a range finder and then listening to background music or something. Right, in that case, those are unrelated. So even if there's no intervening event, you're gonna be disqualified. So gotcha. I use the rod to try to get me lined up to hit it down the fairway. And I use the rod, and then I hit, and I hit it 30 degrees off to the right, and I pull it back out to try to see how I didn't get myself uh, lined up properly to hit it down the fairway. But I'm using it the second time simply because I, I obviously didn't get lined up the first time when I took it out to, no. to try to get it. My, my, my advice would be to use a club rather than, than the uh, line <laughs> and rod. But I think the answer is you're disqualified because that you have used it both times to, to, to affect, to create a potential advantage by preparing for or making a stroke such as helping with swing plane grip alignment, and that's really what you're talking about is alignment. Yeah, the alignment. And so you've done it twice, and down. there's an intervening event. Scary. Have you seen this new alignment thing that the, the T goes into, and it's probably three inches long max, two and a half? Your T goes right in the middle of it, it points the direction this way. I just saw it advertised this weekend. And you put your ball on your T, and it's a form of an alignment. I just want to let you know that it's out Sounds like a non Yes. I'm sure it's non conforming. Right. But just to let you know, there's going to be people in some of our events that come up with this. And some of our guys that play in the events <laughs> might. <laughs> All right. So the question is when is the player disqualified? Or when does the player get a penalty? Only when he makes a stroke. You're right. permitted to carry it because it's a piece of non-conforming right. equipment and you haven't made a stroke with it, so you're okay. If you make a stroke and that stroke counts in the score, so the player better hope that it's so the, match play and he's, and he's used it and his opponent recalls the stroke. So the question is, stroke play tournament, one of our rules officials are in the group with him. Does he say something before Absolutely. he hits or attempts to hit or does he not? Uh, That's a rhetorical question. Yeah, I, I, I hope it is. <laughs> because we, we talked about that in the past. If yeah. a player is about to tee off in front of the tee marker, you as a rules official are there, you would say something like, you know, excuse me, sir, do you, you know, would you like to take a look at so this? You're a little bit behind the head of the tee marker. Yeah. Jim, you wanted to use that, didn't you? Alignment rod, I, but I do play with a guy who has an alignment rod who uses it a lot on the practice team. And I'm wondering what the hell is he doing? <laughs> Any other questions or concern before we tell Jeff to sign us off? Okay, Jeff, I think sign us off. This woman.